Welcome to the pre-caucus meeting of the Common Council. Today is June 16th, 2021. We're going to start off the meeting with resolution number one. It is a resolution authorizing the sale of wine and beer to Handshake City. The sponsor's name is Handshake City. The event is Barks and Brews. The date of the event is Sunday, June 27th, 2021 from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. located at Handshake City, 26 Whitesboro Street, Utica, New York, 13502. Everyone okay? The second one is ordinance number two. It is an ordinance amending chapter 2-14, license permits and miscellaneous business regulation article X1XIV, neighborhood related certification certificate of use be it ordained that section 2-14-337 of code of ordinance for the city of Utica is amended to read as follows neighborhood retail establishment neighborhood retail shall mean a retail sales business within less than 6,000 square feet of gross floor area devoted in whole or part to the sale of dry goods and food and beverages consume goods and prepared food sales to be used and consumed primarily off the premises. Mr. Majority Leader, I'd like to save you some breath. Um, we're, we're doing a moratorium, another piece of legislation, so I'd like to refer this to the committee until we do the study. Is that okay? okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, yeah, same thing with number three. I'll save you a little bit more breath. <laughs> And um, we like to schedule and a meeting. Four. And four, yes. And four. If Next you resolution. Thank you. thank you. Next is resolution number five, sponsored by Council Member Friend. It's a resolution approving and endorsing Uptown Theater for, for Creative Arts as applicant for an Uptown Theater renovation project in its application to New York State Home and Community Renewal for funding under the New York State Main Street Program for Downtown anchor building renovations. I, I got one question. I, yeah. I'm, I'm for this, but is right. it Main Street? Is that, is it downtown? That's uptown. Yeah, I spoke to the, the program administrators, right, about this, and they had no issue with that because they mean downtown in like the general sort of generic sense of like a commercial district. So since the uptown theater is located in a kind of, you know, commercial sort of district, they don't have any issue with whether this is eligible. But I mean, it's, good, it's a reasonable question, but they consider the, that uptown neighborhood. You don't know if you don't ask, right? Absolutely. No, I think it's a reasonable question. And they said that they consider the uptown neighborhood a downtown with a lower D yeah. as in a Main Street kind of commercial district. Thank you. Councilman Miola, you have the floor. Um, the only suggestion I have, Councilman Friend, is that um, I'm, I'm for this also. Uh, there's also another uh, par uh, party that wants the same grant, a uh, piece of this grant. Is it possible that our clerk um, and Brian will have the legislation for our next meeting? Is it possible that our clerk could submit it to the state at the same time instead of sum uh, submitting them differently? Would that be okay? Because we'll, we'll vote for this tonight. When, when oh, and then in terms of when they actually go to the so, state right. under the same cover? Yes, that majority leader. To me. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, majority oh, leader, any question? Thank you very much. So what you're talking about is two resolutions that will pass separately, right. and then the clerk will submit both of them. Together to the state at the same That's, time. Yeah, that seems like a kind of fine. Thank you. I just want to play, be fair to both parties. Yep. President Galimi, you have the floor. Had the floor. Come back. This was a question actually for Commissioner Thomas, which actually is related to uh, what Councilman Miola just brought up. I was going to ask if there was another applicant. Sounds like there is. Um, is there any uh, issue with how we pass this? Do we have to do anything different with both 
applying? Because I know in the past we've picked which one we would endorse rather than endorsing both. Yes, it was always my understanding that the city could only apply with one application. Um, however, both I and Councilman Friend reached out to the state agency that manages and administers these funds and did say that uh, while they prefer that only one application be submitted, it, it, it's not a hard and fast rule of theirs. So okay. multiple applications can be endorsed by this body. So, and we have to endorse it with the same resolution since it's the same? No, it'd be different resolutions. Okay, okay. They're going to be worded very similarly, but. Okay. Can as long I as they're both can I cleared pick, through us. Can yeah. I just piggyback on that? Yeah. To, to just expand upon what the commissioner said, they said they have their preferences, but people, but cities do this all the time and they don't do anything to prohibit them from doing so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions or concerns? Okay, moving forward. Ordinance number six, sponsored by Council Member Burmaster, intersection where stop required, ordain that section 2-16-358, Schedule C, intersection where stop required, be amended to include the following. Highland Ave and Downer Ave Northeast Corner, Highland Avenue and Downer Avenue Southwest Corner. Be it further ordained that the proper signage be erected where necessary. Are you okay with that one? Next is ordinance number seven, sponsored by Council Member Moody. No parking at all times rescinded. Ordain that section 2-16-360 schedule E, no parking at all times, Brinkerhoff Avenue east side from Arthur Street to point southerly of Roosevelt School property line, Brinkerhoff Ave east side front of Roosevelt School property, Brinkerhoff Ave east side from southern property line of Roosevelt School on James Street, Brinkerhoff Avenue, West Side between Rucker Street and James Street, Brinkerhoff Ave, West Side between Rucker Street and Arthur Street be rescinded. Are you okay with that? Yeah, th this is to, um, uh, just give a this is to clean up uh, what's on the books to fit where the signage already is. For example, if there's no parking between Rucker and uh, South Street, but that's now the signage is alternating days or odd days. So this cleans that up and eight corresponds to that. You might note, um, we did not change. There's one uh, thing, it's westward from south all the way up to Pleasant Street, except in between, um, in front of the Roosevelt School Apartments. And so that is on the east side and that is gonna be remaining the same. But that's our legislation is with it. Gotcha. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Next is ordinance number eight for council member Moody. No parking at all times. Ordain that section 2-16-360 schedule E, no parking at all times be amended to include the following. Brinkerhoff Ave West Side between South Street and Arthur Street. Brinker, Brinkerhoff Ave West Side between James Street and Pleasant Street. Be it further ordained that the proper signage be erected where necessary. Okay. Next is ordinance number nine. Councilmember Miola and Councilmember Beatrice. An ordinance establishing a temporary moratorium on convenience store and smoke shop in the city of Utica for not less than six month period that may be extended. Uh, would the full council like to sponsor this? Okay. Yes. I've called. No, I, I don't want to um, sponsor, but I, I, I will vote for it, but I do have some questions. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, so the moratorium on the convenience stores and stuff like that for six months, um, I know it's outlined here that if the report is not given, it'd be more than six months. I would like to see a date, but I understand that the language identifies what we're trying to say. But my, my problem is with the conversation that we've been having is I still don't know what the legislative fix is and what the report will yield. Is it that we don't want certain types of stores in certain type of communities, right? I feel like that was one conversation being had, being had. The other thing was about who has the power to decide what type of stores go in what type of community. That's a separate conversation, right? And so I don't know if the moratorium will achieve that if the report is not given because I don't know that there's an appetite from uh, the commissioner and others to even Yes, ma'am. Only Lucretia can do that. Now, I, won't let you. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's an appetite to even produce that report um, 
<laughs> in a timely fashion given the conversation we've been having. But I, I just don't know if this is going to change anything. That's, so that's my hesitation with the moratorium. The second thing is I really feel the biggest problem, and I don't know how we legislate this, is with this planning board and these, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Zoning variants? Uh, the variants. I said at the end of the day, that's what we got to look at, the planning board and the variants. Because we go through this whole process, we get a report, and if the planning board can do whatever they want to do, well, ZBA, do whatever they want to do anyway, uh, are we just going to be back here in a year from now? Uh, that's so, so to me, with the moratorium, I get it in the, in, the, in, in the temporary sense, but if I'm thinking down the road, what's the real route that's going to give us the power that we want? Either we, either we, work, with the administ e either we work with the administration to say, look, we want a ZBA that's not going to be granted all these variances, or we pull back the, the string. We could do a study on it. And in addition to that, the ZBA, uh, they have their authority and the council's got their authority. To transfer any authority, councilman, that would be either have to go for a referendum or something different. So, right, we would have to look into that. That's a different issue. But this, this issue is just for um, to hold off on any type of additional businesses like this, um, opening up too close to each other and stuff like that. We're going to uh, do a study on it with uh, Brian's help and uh, hopefully come together with a good amendment for our zoning legislation so all of us could see um, the differences and what we could constraints that we could put in these stores that um, do fit in good neighborhoods so that the business and the neighbors could fit together council person friend do you have the floor i'd like to defer to uh, to the yeah. commissioner thomas and then i'll speak Thank and you. i'm not trying to say that you all won't do it i'm sure you all will comply but well, i was just going to respond yeah. the, the administration is interested in working with the council to, to come up with a solution that works for all to, to solve this problem so what I'd like to add to a couple of things, this is also an issue of a certain kind in South Utica. We now have three separate stores, and it strikes me that the pattern in part involves smoke shops. And we the also three stores that. in right. South Utica that are a problem, the Sunset so, Ave, uh, the uh, Roosevelt Ave, and Genesee Street are all smoke shops. Yeah. So I think part of what we might really want to look at in the next six months is the question about s a separately regulating smoke shops. Mm -hmm. I can't help but wonder whether these smoke shops have their eye on the change state laws around marijuana, and yeah. they're putting themselves in the right kind of position, so I think we ought to think about that. I also would like to say, and I know that this is a dead horse that I'm going to drag from its grave to beat, well, I was going to say one more time, but I don't promise to not beat it more than one more time. I'd like to see the council have the authority to issue these permits. We talked about this with the neighborhood convenience that one requirement would be a, a council resolution authorizing the placement of these stores on the grounds that council people know their, their, their areas better than anybody else. I know that we've been around on that before. We uh, will, that's what well, uh, Councilman uh, Lamedico, you have the floor. Yeah, well, just, uh, you're mentioning the smoke shops. That's why I, I added it to this, to this piece of legislation here. But I, I was talking to uh, uh, Marcus and uh, he's going to be bringing someone on board, hopefully. Part of that person's uh, issue is going to be to count how many smoke shops we actually have in the city, where they're located, so we can really uh, get a good number on them. And that way we could have a better job of actually regulating, you know, and, and figuring out what the city really could handle load-wise. Right. So, Marcus, did you want to say anything on that? or? Guidance on 
what the moratorium entails in that regard. And, and yeah, I would like some time to set up the permitting program and to do it right so that I can give you guys the kind of statistics that you're looking for as far as how many exist, what neighborhoods are saturated, stuff like that. Right now, I can't do it because it's, it's not organized yet. But we'll, we'll be making sure we keep you in the loop on this and we'll be inviting you to the to meetings discussing it as well. Right. Judge Garamone, you have the floor. There is a, one ordinance that I didn't include tonight that was on my mind, but I, uh, in deference to uh, uh, the commissioner and commissioners, when we uh, look at the uh, ordinance that was adopted, it says zoning maps and districts, and there are eight districts mentioned. When we look at the definition in the zoning ordinance you adopted neighborhood retail in the eight districts mentioned there is no neighborhood retail what you have uh, under umu which was contained in the memo that you got from brian thomas at the last meeting as to explain what that district was with the six thousand square feet there is no such place in the law, although he says it exists, and therefore number three, which is neighborhood mixed use, was U uh, uh, number two rather, urban mixed use, is UMU. But he described UMU, what we did, which was a less, re uh, less restrictive than I think it was M -N -N -M -U, which is neighborhood mixed use. Remember that memo? Yes, you will. Mm -hmm. So I, wa I was thinking I had to really amend that too, that also. But I thought that that's going too far without having uh, Mr. Thomas's input. And that's why uh, the three ordinances are there, all are conformity. Neighborhood retail in all three ordinances is the same thing and the 6,000 uh, square feet, which uh, we, I thought, uh, you'll see it's blank. Everything in parentheses is new, by the way. When you got another line in it, it's old. It's what's in the old law. Two or three of you, at the last meeting, Mr. Phillips said he was thinking we needed a number, he said 10,000, remember that? Right. After that, he wrote a memo to me via my phone he was suggesting 7,500, and he had some other suggestions, which I thought were very legitimate. And of course, whenever we do anything and restrict and do things, we also affect Mr. Phillips, we affect Mr. Thompson, Thomas, we affect, affect everybody in, in there. And for me to put another ordinance in, which I, I had copies made, that talked about this, these, uh, the city of Uke is hereby divided into the following districts. Neighborhood retail isn't in there, but it's UMU according to the memo. So that, that, that sounds a little confusing. I believe that every ordinance that describes a place should be uniformly uh, describing the place. It's always, because you remember you did pass a convenience store ordinance. And that was done in November of 2019. So they're already in an ordinance, a little bit watered down, but it's still there. So I think the suggestion that was made by Councilman Miola when he requested this ordinance about moratorium uh, also made sense because that really uh, we uh, when we do things that were that are a little confusing, and uh, to me, I don't believe in amending everything without the very person who persons who actually do these things, which is Mr. Thomas and Mr. Phillips, they've got to be taken into consideration. His suggestions, Mr. Phillips' suggestions, I didn't put them in there in an ordinance form because this is something he has to talk about. He's a contributor. Mr. Thomas, uh, this the lack of neighborhood retail in the zoning map and district's description in Article uh, 3 is not there. 
Was that an oversight? Should it be there? And does it replace uh, urban mixed use? Or does urban mix, mixed use and UMU uh, designation, uh, not the right designation? Anyway, the fact okay. that I have questions in my mind, the fact that you have questions in your mind, the fact that we put back in the law about the 2,000 uh, feet thing because you don't want to oversaturate an area, as uh, Councilman Fred mentioned, in her district. All of that has to be studied again, maybe. Remember, the zoning law was a big, big task for Mr. Thomas. It was a big, big task for you. It was the most pages I've ever seen in an ordinance that's been adopted by this council in years. And so everything needs to be tweaked. And, uh, and I think that when you tweak it, you finally get it right, or at least you think you have a, a more of an input. And it's my job to tell you what I find that I find inconsistencies on and try to eliminate the inconsistencies. inconsistencies. And that's why I think the, how you frame the moratorium and what you do with that is uh, it's not my concern uh, because I don't legislate. I'm just saying to you that, that we have to restudy some areas of this and make sure we meet, uh, have a meeting of the minds about how we're labeling these districts. And uh, the conformity is uh, very Thank important you. because people who make applications use that conformity when they go to court and they challenge things. And that, and as you know, I've always said you time and again, my job is to win in the courthouse, always. And to win in the courthouse, you have to uh, you eliminate the inconsistencies. Thank, thank you, Judge. That's all I have to say on the matter. Thank and you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Councilman Moody, you have the floor. Yeah, I got a quick, just a quick question. I know we passed that convenience store legislation. What's, where, where are we in terms of regulating convenience stores? That's what this is for, for the study yeah, on that's, it. That's what this is for. So where we are is um, we've been asking them slowly, slower than I would like, to get licenses and, and to comply with the first set of um, with the first set of rules that were laid out. There was some talk recently about amending those sets of rules, increasing the fines, um, expanding the definition. Square footage. More specific in certain words, right? Yeah. And, and, and I have a real concern, you know, I, I've been hesitant since those conversations have come up to even give out any permits, even to existing stores, because I have a real concern about what the unintended consequences of some of this stuff was. And, and that's why I think we need to to talk about it because I don't want to incorporate businesses that none of us recognize as convenience stores into legislation that's meant for convenience stores. Are we voting on this tonight? Yes. Just the moratorium. Just the moratorium. Did that grandfather anybody in? Well, that's that's my question. Um, I would I would need legal advice or advice from the council or whoever gives it on how to enforce this. Because I, I I don't know that I would want a grandfather. But if I'm building a store right now. I give you a building permit to build a store. I go shut them down and say, you can't open the council pass the moratorium? Can I do that? I don't worry. Can do that? Yeah, I, I would think if they're in the process for it or if they have a building permit for it or a certificate of occupancy that they apply for, I would say no. But yeah, if they I bought would. a building with the intent to be a convenience store that was otherwise legally done, I can stop them from? That I would say yes. I mean, the intent is one thing. Another thing is actually getting it up and ready. Correct. Yeah. Should that be clearly defined in the ordinance? I think it's going to be a case-by-case. It, case it's going to, right, it depends on it. It's so, going to be case-by-case. Case. Yes, I don't so think we need to. When we say grandfather, I, I think that's defined somewhere in our that's Somebody's already it's operating. It's defined in this moratorium, but. Right. Moratorium starts from this day forward. Yeah, so yes. We can't yes. redact that. But temporary. Correct. So we get six, months. six months. And maybe less if we get so this done faster. I won't accept any more permits. Until we revi revise. from anybody that isn't already in process. Right. Until we re revisit this legislation. Correct. Store. If they already have a permit filed with me. Right. For that. And they've already applied for a certificate of occupancy. And not, putting, them open. and not putting that in the ordinance does not open us up to any liability. No. Not putting what into the ordinance. What he just said. Not putting, not writing that 
does that open us it, up in to the anything? moratorium does it specifically say that there is a grandfather clause in there or no 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 it doesn't have to because it's normal if they applied before the the laws in, in the enacted so we say, we're saying going forward we are stopping. from this day forward absolutely okay. that's cool. right from six, 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 mark. Date, that, one more, I have one more yes. thing because I, I want to get the intent clear because I'm going to enforce the law one more scenario that I'm also dealing with stores that are open now that never got a proper certificate of occupancy so I got to shut them down and normally the process is you shut them down you make them apply for a certificate of occupancy when you're sure they're satisfied now it's shut them down. Whatever good you got in the store, that's your problem. So we're not going to bring you through the process. You hold. You hold. So can we talk about how that applies to Sunset then? Sunset never got a CFO. No, Let, let's hold okay. the certificate of occupancy until we're, the legislation is finalized. Okay? Because they they don't have one now. So what's the difference? How long did they operate right, without one? And if they're operating, right, that's, if they're operating without one and never applied, let's hold the certificate. Let's CFO until we're done. But if they apply, I have to let them go through. With Right. I told the CFO until legislation is revised. Can, can I make a suggestion on that then? Each why, case why don't is different. We, why don't we give them 30 days no, to apply? Each case is different, Jack. Every case, you got to do case by case. Right. Well, each if they're already in business and they're operating, and they're operating why, why not say, okay, you got 30 days to get it or we're going to shut you down? Right. Okay. I, I like that. Yeah. If they're already in business, you got it. Right. Okay. Right. And they don't have wait, 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 wait. So we do this moratorium, they got 30 days to get a certificate of. CFO. These are people that are already operating and that, that did not get one yet. So Correct. For a specific. Can I ask a general question? Why do we allow that? Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask. Why the why the heck do we allow people to operate stores without certificate of occupancies? Because I think I don't want to answer for Marina. She's the lawyer, but I think what happens is they can show a loss that other people can't show. They can they hardship. They they, they, they can say, oh. look. They didn't know that they had to go through this process. They never saw a building permit, and we're forcing them to take money they spent and throw it in the garbage, whereas other people never put the money into opening the store. So they have a measurable loss that they can show us right now. But if but if you have to have a certificate of occupancy in order to own, in order to operate a store, and you go to the trouble to stock a store without getting one, and now you're going to suffer a loss, that looks like their problem. I have, I have a question and for the lawyers. Can I can I ask? Corporation Council oh, questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even yeah, houses why should have <laughs> certificates of occupancy, too. I mean, and sometimes they, we just don't have them or we don't give them out. I mean, I'm not saying it's right, but it's something that we deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. If there's a complaint, we'll, you know, we'll address it. Um, but like you said, even for houses, like for closings that right. I deal with, you know, they want certificates of occupancy. It's just something that we don't have for every single house or every single business. Uh, but you are correct, they should have one, yes. But, so, but at least, I mean, in sorry, no, in, but in principle, right? Yeah. I mean, now I get it, we only have so many staff, right, we only have right. so many actual resources, can't get blood out of a stone, I get that. But right. in principle at least, you don't open your door and you don't sell a single can of Coca-Cola until the city has said, go ahead, right? Right. right? right, I think the past practice for us has always been and, and this is different. Now you gotta realize we're looking at this in a very different context than we usually look at business. Guy puts his money in, opens a business, doesn't cross all the regulatory hurdles, doesn't know they exist, might not have a lawyer, might not have done it before. Our past practice is always trying to work with him to bring him into compliance rather than to punish the investment that's already yeah, taken yeah, place. Right. Yeah. There's that so, staff issue. Yeah, uh, okay. Is it a staffing right. issue? Well, it's always going to be a staff. Unless we have one person on every single block right. checking every single house, right. it's always going to be a staff issue just because when somebody opens something, sometimes I'm unaware. Right. Council uh, President, 30 days long enough for you anymore. 30 days is fine. So if I figure out that they're operating without a certificate of occupancy, I say you got 30 days to come into compliance. I'm okay with that. I can do that. Marcus, so what you is have to the way. The legal terms are different for you than they are for the Corporation Council and me. You use words like grandfather, you use words like non conforming use, and all those things. They're all legal terms, and there are. Uh, guidelines in the legal sense that the corporation council is faced with when people are making a claim one way or the other and the corporation council's job not to tell them what they do they know what they're doing is they have to know when they make a decision it's one that they will be supported should it be challenged and i think the corporation council would agree with me on that yeah. these are legal terms this is what they deal with they deal with much different terms when they're up there and that's why 
when a person like Mr. Phillips goes and looks, and he's asked to look, examine things, everything looks the same except that when you look at it again at that time, maybe a year later, things are different, and you're not going to get a certificate of occupancy. You may have been renting a property for years, right. and all of a sudden the new owner comes in, he wants to do the same thing. He, he isn't going to get a certificate of occupancy because he can't look at every building in the city of Utica. It, it's impossible. It, it's a, a, the, the matter comes to him, it becomes an issue, and he has to make a decision. If he doesn't know if he's making the right decision, he goes over to the corporation council and says, what do I do with this? And they tell him. That's their job. And then he goes forward. So everything's a case-by-case -case basis. And we, what we do here is a general <coughs> overview. Now, as far as the time limit, whether you want to have a moratorium, if you want to give the codes director um, more uh, a flexibility, do so. And uh, right. man, you're, if, you're, if you're interested in doing the, the main point of some moratorium, but you want to conform it to make Mr. Phillips uh, do his job and Mr. Thomas do his job, uh, you can uh, do all sorts of things and you can amend it and take their suggestions, amend it that way, and then they're comfortable doing their jobs, each one of them, and uh, you're comfortable in uh, looking backwards about the whole thing. I think the, I think the definition of neighborhood retail is a, a serious issue. I think that 605C was a good law and it, it may have been inadvertently uh, taken out, uh, but that's where you, you really control the district by distances. Uh, all those things are very good. If you're not ready to do them tonight, fine. If, you're, if you want to look at this thing more yeah, we're gonna have and you want to amend this moratorium, matter we did it in a matter of like an overnight, uh, council. I to do what you wish. The You're the council council. person's intent, and, and, and it's clear to me now, as written. You don't need to amend it. I talked to Marie, I talked to you guys. You can, as I know, I know which one. Thank you. We, we don't need to do this on the fly. Put the uh, the the uh, no, nope. the thirty day. No. Nope. He's good. Are y'all saying is that we don't have to? I want to be clear. We don't have to because I don't want no smoke. <laughs> I mean, for lack of, I don't want no issues because I got smoke shops and corner stores and stuff, and they'll be calling my phone saying, you, you know what I mean? So I want to make sure that we don't need that language. You, you can't, no you can't legislate specific issues. That's a specific issue that he has for the C of O. Each business has this. That's a specific issue that he has for a C of O. In other words, there's different issues for distances and stuff like that. That's our job to legislate. He has to decide if that business deserves a COO because they're grandfathered in and stuff like that, it's a, that it comes in compliance with the legislation that we have. So that's his job. Our job is to give him guidelines to go by. We just gave him a guideline, which was 30 days. But again, the 30 day thing, technically everyone is supposed to have the certificate. Right. Okay. So, All right, so I mean, technically right now, I can, I can, you know, we can cite these people for not having it, but with this moratorium, we're trying to give them a little bit more time. Right. Look, please go get it. We'll work with you as opposed to, you know. closing them down immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Marcus. I mean, right, again, if you pointed to me and said, look, these people don't have one, yes, I could technically I could take them to court yeah. and we can okay. you know, do it that way. So I think doing the 30-day, giving them that time, I think that's more than enough. Um, to more process. To, I, got one like to I got a question here. I've been waiting. So when you go to these stores, what is the basis? How do you know? Do you have paperwork that says store opened up on Brinkerhoff Ave to go to, or is it that you have to send people up and down the street and walk into the store? So do you know what store just opened and they have a permit or they don't, or is it just by random knocking on the door? Well, depending on, depending on what you're talking about. So for the permits, we randomly go to them now. Nobody knows it exists. We talk to the store owners, look, you gotta get a permit, right? That's, that's one issue. For certificate of occupancies, right, which is what I think you're talking about, um, generally, we give them a certificate of occupancy upon the construction or the building that needs to take place in order for them to make their store code compliant. So we do 1203 fire, um, fire inspections and, and we go there every three years. So we see in three years, hey, they're, to get a certificate of occupancy, you gotta come in compliance, they get a building permit, and they go that way. Or we'll get a complaint about a code violation in a certain store. And we'll say, hey, this store doesn't even have a certificate of occupancy. If he does it right, he comes to us first. Yes. Okay, but, but so Okay, so if there's a vacant if there's a vacant building on Genesee Street right now or any street. Right. Vacant, it's in a commercial district, 
I go, I go in there and rent it out. I could just open a store up without getting any permits or anything from you at all. Well, and you wouldn't even know. What you could, but the problem with that is normally going to be if you go into a building. First of all, every three years it's going to need a twelve three inspection. Okay, but, but second of all, if you can just move in and the building is shovel ready, chances are your use is pretty much in line with the building. You would usually have to make some kind of changes to turn a building to be out of code that was in code. Right. So that's generally how we find out. If you, if you go into a store that wasn't meant to serve food, you're going to have to get a permit to get freezers and stoves. Okay, you but if it was a corner thing. store that was a corner store that sold stuff, shelves were ready, everything's ready, the guy closed down for two years, Celeste goes in and opens it up, the only way that you're going to know they don't have a permit is you're sending a guy up and down that street and walks Every in the door. three years we're doing a, a 12 So three years, but we got a six-month... Um, 30 days. 30 days. So how do, you, how do you find it out? How do we find it out? You, yeah. you don't really, right? Well, no. What, what I'm going to do and what I'm taking this as, if I do find out that you're, that you're open now, I'll give you 30 days to come into compliance right. with folks. But my, my question is, how, you gonna, how do you find you're randomly going to walk in there? I mean, you're not going to... Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's not like you've got paperwork for 10 issue, stores. Right? right? It's like we get a complaint, right? Or we do an inspection for some other reason. Okay. It's, it's usually issue based. We don't randomly go to stores and say, hey, I'm just checking to see if everybody has their CFO. We don't do that. Okay. And my last question is when you mentioned before, how many do you have stores right now that are. Right. That's that's what I'm saying. Do, do you have. Yeah, but how would you even know if you don't have to get anything? No, there's two, there's two ways that we can do that. The schedule is for 1203s every three years. If you want us to do it, what, every day, every six months? No, what, 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 no. What, I, we're just, I just think, the, excuse me, I just think the city's behind. I can't imagine wh why we don't have, uh, have something on a computer that says every store that's in the city, we do. every store that we has do. it. So, so what do we, so don't you, uh, within that database, don't you have, to, don't you have a, a check mark there? They have the, they, they have the certificate of compliance? Yes. So you could go. You could look right now, then, and see who does who's operating right now and doesn't have that the certificate. I can, I can look up her permits and see who has issued a certificate of occupancy. That doesn't mean that's who's occupying the store right now. Can I if suggest that we're going to be working on this? Wait, wait one second. I went, if it, something changes between when I went there, right, and the next time I go there. Right. I'm trying. I, don't, to, I have no way of knowing. That. Or if a new so, person, if a vacant store opens up that's within the, you know, with on Genesee Street was a was a was a grocery store been closed for two years now somebody's in there you're not going to get notified unless somebody complains well the loss is that they should notify so most people follow the law yes most people do it okay some don't yeah. right and we catch them when they're due for inspections okay like this permit inspection is every two years so i'm going to send the guy to start it off to every business to check to go but then he's going back in two years Right. If something happens between the first permit and the second permit, I'm only going to know if I have a complaint or if I have to respond to that address for some days. Okay, now wait. My last question is a simple one. So we're, we're going to have this legislation, and nobody new is going to be able to open up for the six months. Well, how, how many, unless they already filed paperwork and are in the process, how many, how many do you have right now? Do you have stores in the process to file paperwork? You, uh, I mean, I, I, I mean I can, roughly how I mean I can go upstairs and look it up. Well, no, I, I mean just roughly. Is it ten? Is it fifty? Um, no, it's ten. Ten. Okay, so they you have ten people who aren't opened yet, but they require to ask for a permit, and they're going to be opening up. Okay. Any variances? Ten, fifteen. Possibly variances. I mean, there's there's a million variances. There's I don't think there's anybody right now seeking a variance. Um, that I know of. Not that I'm aware of either. That I'm aware. But there's some, but, but what you're thinking, though, you got to keep in mind, there's places that have already gotten variances. So one of the examples that I have is the guy on Oneida Square, right? He wouldn't need a variance now because there's no 2,000 foot law, but they already got a variance. It's already been a convenience store. He's doing work to reopen that convenience store. File paperwork, right? So yeah, that would be something under the old law that would require a variance. Yeah, and I want something in this law that says he can't open. But they've already got one. There you go. I mean, they're already working on it. They already could. That's happened to me, too. We're that 2004. Yeah. So then what is this going to I mean, it's going to stop it in the future. In the future. What's in process now, it's not stopping. It's like the same thing on Rucker Street, correct? Right. It's in process. Right. It's going to stop new processes. It's going to stop the next door in Oneida Square. And this is my problem, and this is why I keep going back to the DBA, because 
we need to we need to call them to to bear. I feel like right because why do you keep approving this stuff in our community? Well, generally, I mean, I can give you my impression. I, it's just an opinion, but generally, I'm serious about that. No, no, I'm generally, in the interest, generally, but I'm serious listen, about that. You're right. Generally, <laughs> neighborhoods that don't have a lot of residents mm -hmm. turn out. It's it's not a difficult decision to make a ruling against, you know, and, and no that's pressure. generally my experience. But Brian wouldn't say that he's cringing now. Um, <laughs> but 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 if you get a bunch of neighbors turn out, they put pressure on DBA. They don't want to do the unpopular thing. If it's if it's just an agenda item. Right, the only person there to take off is, is the store. Right? Although, can I just say though, it can't be more complicated than that because that terrible store on Sunset that the neighbors turned out in force. They were so smart and together, and they worked hard. And a certain council person canvassed them first to get them to do that, and the ZBA turned them down. And that store is open. Right, if you I know bring that out it could be more. Neighbors, but then the store no, but the ZBA out turned them down. I'm but saying you're right. The but store figures out another use that is legal. Right. Like but I also feel like that's the disconnect with right. the council person knowing what's going where because they know their districts. They right. know if it's going right. to be an issue. Can I, I want to circle back to something that was said earlier and back out to the bigger picture. Um, Ms. Commissioner Thomas, you and I have talked about in the past, when I've gone to planning boards that have something to do with my district, um, I can get called on as a courtesy, but if it's not a public hearing, I don't have any right to speak. And the planning board is nice, right? He does call on me as a courtesy, Mr. Burke. Um, but I would like it if planning boards, if council members at planning boards had the right to speak and say what they think is good or not for that area. And I think we probably would have to amend part of the law for that. That's not just, it's not in under anyone's simple discretion. Um, I don't know if it would mean making every public hearing every planning board meeting a public hearing i don't know what would be involved but i mean i i know that you and i talked about it you were going to follow up on that with attorney hartnett and of course she's but marima is I, taking this notes. is the first time right. um, i'm That's hearing fine. about this i don't know Brian, I, if I would like it if, if council members could at planning boards always have the right to speak not just rely upon the goodwill of the chair just because planning boards well, ZBAs are always, by definition, okay. public hearings, so we always do have the right to speak. Right. But planning boards may or may not be a public hearing. Correct. So you, you see where I'm getting at? We already have the right to speak at ZBAs. I want us to always have the right to speak at any planning board and right. to speak on behalf of our community. I believe and I want to second that, too. Right. Because we'll look into that. Okay. Can we, okay. Can we figure that out, maybe, and get some legislation on yeah, our agenda in again. July? Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'll look into it. Thank you. Yes. Councilman Miel. Yeah. I thought it was a courtesy of the chair at the planning board to let a council member speak. It, it, it was, it, no, it it was and then it changed. It is. The courtesy. He, but in other words, the chair of the planning board can do it as a courtesy, right. but he does not have to do it as a courtesy. So right. we have no right to speak at a planning board. Right. We have to depend upon someone's right. goodwill. And I want it to be an actual. That can be an easy fix. Okay, thank you. I want it to be yes. built in as our right to do so. You, you, you know what another thing might be that we should be, we could be probably notified if a convenience store or a smoke shop applies for a fair specifically. I know they said it's the agenda, right. but maybe something that to the clerk that says convenience store. Yeah, a, a big red flag. Like, yes, a big like red a flag. Store. The problem right. is, the problem is the areas, like I stated, that was a store and they're in codes, they're in the right area. <laughs> They don't have to notify anybody. That's where we run into our problems. Well, that's what the studies from right. up. Yeah, that's where we run into the problems. I get it, Commissioner Thomas. I'm learning. I get it. Can we? I think I we ought to. We got leader. Can we move forward? Do you want? I do. But we have one more piece of legislation. Yeah, we, yeah, we can yep. move forward. Right? No, it's just everybody. Well, everybody yeah, but course. Selvin, right? I, yeah. I'm talking to me around. I'm all right, every, everybody on it. <laughs> Clerk, right. would you sponsor anybody on, please. Thank Moving you. forward, ordinance number ten, council member friend, no parking at all times. Ordain that two dash one six dash three six zero schedule E, no parking at all times, be amended to include the following: Hazelhurst Avenue West Side from Maryland Avenue to point in front of nine hundred and forty seven Hazel. Hazelhurst Avenue, be it further ordained that the proper signage be erected where necessary. So can I just want to speak to this very quickly. I know that this only came to you today. Um, I was doing a lot to get caught up in constituent services today and exchange some emails 
with Deputy Chief Noonan. Uh, so that's why this is coming to you late. Um, this is simply uh, the little um, park at Gilmore Village. You know how there's a little playground there? And currently we have parking allowed on both sides of the street and a lot of children going back and forth. So the police department did a traffic survey over there and gave a bunch of very specific recommendations. And the only one that we need to concern ourselves with here tonight is to make no parking on the side of the street where the, um, where the little park is. So it won't be, in, it, it's not the case that anybody will no longer be able to park in front of their house. And I appreciate your indulgence in my violation of the Thursday rule. We'll I love the Thursday rule. I live for the Thursday rule. Written waiver. Explaining. It was a verbal oh, waiver. It was a verbal waiver. So you're good with that, right, Celeste? It's, could, the deputy <laughs> chief, could the deputy clerk write up a memo explaining my... Um, it's all down here from, here from here, people. There's no rule I won't break now. Okay. Okay, so... No. Is that the... Are we? No, that's in the... Right. No, that's in the... So we're going to put it ready. Hold on. Yeah, we're putting it ready. Huh? Oh, you can do it. Do you want me to do it? When we come through my thing, we're going to put this. Yeah, we're going to do it. No, I got two. All right. Uh, next, do you want to? So I wanted to use some of our time tonight just to talk a little bit about some things I wanted Ten minutes. to talk about. Yeah, I'll, I could do it even quicker than that. Mr. Mutolo, thank you for joining us tonight. I just had some general sort of IT kinds of questions for you. So first, at our last meeting, the, the council did pass a resolution both establishing a Facebook page, but also including Facebook Live. Could you just explain to us That's where we are in that process? Facebook page would have to be created by someone in the county. Right. Maintained by someone in the council. Let's get to the microphone. Well, which they've done. So they've established a Facebook page. We have a Facebook page. The only part I'm wondering about now is why we're not Facebook Live. Before you go on, I just want to mention that they didn't have Facebook Live. Yeah. I, I believe it does. Okay, well, we can just. Okay, I will. Okay. So that was one thing I had a question about why we weren't doing that yet. But they have gone ahead and done the work of establishing the page, which is great. I commend them for that. So then the other thing I just wanted to ask about is the website. Um, so when was the, when was the website last redesigned? 2014. 2014, okay. Um, the copyright on the bottom of the homepage says 2015. So we haven't. Right. Right. So the, my understanding is that basic practice is we would update the copyright every year. We would stamp a new copyright 2020, 2021, et cetera. So here's the biggest thing I want to know is what's the, and I'll, I'll give you just a little bit of background first. So there are two general ways in which, in which websites are constructed and maintained. They're either written by code, which is a very hard technical thing that specialists have to know how to do. Uh, my business has a website, and in order for any changes to be made on it, somebody has to write code. So I have a website designer who I pay to do that. Or you can have a kind of drag and drop, plug and play, which is the much more recent, up to date kind of way in which websites are maintained. The website that I run for my art, the arts festival that I direct, is like that. We just redesigned it, launched it six weeks ago. I can go into it and change some of that information. Which way is our website done here in the city? Okay. Some parts of the UF rights and HTML code change certain pieces of it. You have rights and CSS code for styling. Mm -hmm. um, it's not drag and drop in the, the sense of WordPress. Right. It's a content management system. It's okay. not a, just a, uh, right. where people can write it, different pieces of it, and you can go around by the way, no matter your website. So. Right. Okay. 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 That's helpful. So, um, so some things when you want to when we want to change things, some of those things you're able to do in house, and you do them all in house. Okay. Except restyling the entire site. Okay. We do pretty much everything. We don't contract that. Oh, okay. So we do, but our budget. We. So what are we paying for when we pay for one hundred and five thousand? for the software that runs the website. Okay. Okay. That's what that hundred and five thousand contractor no. services. No, it's eighty five hundred dollars. On average, 
feel like it's true of some Right, okay. For the, for the, just like any software to support on it every year. So what's the contract and services that we pay 105000 a year for? We outsource higher level IT support. We have outside people from an outside contract. One of the police department, one city oh, okay. and that whole team behind that. Right, it has okay. Okay, okay. So I, I don't want to list all the mistakes I found on the website, um, but I found a lot and I, f I find it very frustrating and I can only assume that our, um, I, I was about to call them customers, but our constituents find them frustrating as well. I, I hope that the mayor is going to choose to use um, some of the extra money that we have right now to completely redesign the website. But I find lots of, um, I mean, for example, if you go to the home page and you scroll down to the bottom, it says sign up for our newsletter. That and you click on it and there's, it doesn't take you anywhere. Um, you click on coronavirus update and there's nothing that's newer than more than a year old. Want to make you a list, Frankie? No, so some of the, some of the questions you have is very valid. I don't create the content. Right. Okay, it's up to each individual department to give, uh, give us support. There's basically two of us to do it. Give us the content that change on their particular department. Okay, that, so yep. that, that's my role. Is that right. To do that part. The coronavirus updates and all that is produced by the chief of staff. Right. If there's been no new updates, then that's where that stands. Right. The, the newsletter part was a placeholder that we put originally when we designed the website to the thought process from, from different individuals at the time, including council people where we were going to produce some kind of a news release that never came to fruition. The placeholder is still there. So that means but that placeholder, no, I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not holding, I'm, right. you're just the person who can explain to me why it's like right. this. I'm not. You can definitely do that if you want to produce something. But so that, so that placeholder has been there for seven years and for seven years people, if people have clicked on it, they've gone to a dead end. Yeah, so, well, I think so. yeah. well that, I guess. Yeah, more or less a dead end. An almost dead end, right? Um, okay, I, I just, I, I'm, I get very frustrated. The calendars, if you click on where the calendar and you get an actual like month view calendar, there's nothing on it. There's never anything on it. Um, there are a list of some meetings before you click on that, but there's, the calendar is. Because the count, because one of the points of the calendar is council moved to the 360. Right. Right. So there is no really yeah. mistakes. There's just not but but shouldn't all the but no, it, the, the council aren't the only yeah. public yeah. meetings. Yeah. The ZBA and the planning right. board and the water authority, yeah. all of those so are public ZBA meetings. The planning board meetings are listed on the homepage. Jack Spade right. handles all that pretty pretty well. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Our responsibility is the actual site itself, not content. Right. 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 If they give you something, you put it up, and if they don't, you don't. Press releases come up regularly. Right. Right. Personnel changes will be requested by the council. Right. Okay, and then I'll just, so I'll leave the website for now. Um, and then just, and then, it's frustrating to me that in the year 2021, if I come in here with a laptop in order to do work, I can't, there's no Wi Fi. In it's a budgeting issue. We put your wireless outside, but we haven't brought it into the building, and that's that's strictly a budget issue. Okay. Uh, once they get us funds to do that, we'll Enjoy yourself. Bring all the Wi-Fi in. in certain areas. Right. Um, the town council chamber, the caucus chamber, the right. lobby, the right. mayor's conference room, the mayor's conference room. Right. Those are the main focal points. The places. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you came here and stayed as we work through the, the details of zoning update and Council moratoriums and other such exciting, interesting things. Councilman Moody, you have the floor. Yeah, real quick. Um, to all your points, I think that we need to do a meeting, com uh, committee meeting about not only the small things on the website, but connection issues, connectivity issues with the clerk's office to help them maybe navigate all of the um, in and out, see, see how much we can put online, to, that way we don't have to have the in-person stuff, and just do all of that with outside source at a later time. Um, I invited the chiefs uh, to the pre-conference meeting to talk about the homicide rates um, and the arrest rates and that, but given the time, um, I would ask if the chief and deputy chief, if they can update us during our, during their report, during the uh,
common council meeting to sure. talk about because I want us to have understanding of the homicides, the arrests, or the challenges uh, with making some arrests with some of the homicides that were happening in in the, in the city. Absolutely. Yep. Everyone good? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye.
meeting of the City of Houston County Council. I'll call the order. Please, please call the roll. McNeil, Burmaster, Friend, Miola, Moody, Beatrice, Williamson, Lometico, DeBrango, Galimi, all present. Please rise and pledge allegiance, followed by a moment of silence for the deceased members of the council. Pledge allegiance to the spirit of the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to move to waive the reading of the minutes, please, Mr. President. Nine E's adopted. Check one, two. All right, there you go. All right, the public hearing is now closed. Public comment period, next order of business. We do have people signed up to speak. Uh, the first person this evening is David Julian. You've okay. been issued a copy of the rules of order. I'm sorry? The public comment period rule is before you when you signed up. You yes. accept? Thank you very much. Uh, please state your name. My name is David Julian, and I'm here to talk about the disgraceful situation that's going on up at the parkway up on Genesee Street by McDonald's there by Vice President Sherman's statue. There are signs that erected, no panhandling, keep the change, but every day they're out there. They've destroyed the lawn, they've got garbage behind the statue. Now this is my great-great-grandfather and I think it's disgraceful that the police in the Utica city of Utica won't get rid of these people. Why can't we get rid of these people away from those, those places? 
especially since the sign is put up. Why put up the signs? Why did we pay, why did the city um, invest in those signs? Maybe the chief would like to <coughs> respond to it. I would love to. Thank Can you. I? Well, actually, um, during public comment period, uh, the, the chief will respond during uh, reports from the city officers. Please continue. Thank okay. you. Okay, well, that's, that's what I'm here to say, is I think it needs to stop. I think you need to have some enforcement up there and move these people on. I sat in McDonald's parking lot for a couple hours watching these people. <laughs> What's so funny? You, you count and you watch at least 30 cars give them something. If, you, if there's a dollar a car or a dollar a person, for an hour, that person's made $30. They're, sometimes they're out there three, four hours. So let's get, take three hours. They're made $90 in one day, times 30 days a week. That's quite a bit of money. That's more than I make on my Social Security. And also, how, public safety. A car stops to give them money, the car behind them hits them because they didn't expect the car to stop to give them money because he got a green light. But who's at fault is the person that hit the car behind them by tra vehicle traffic law, whether or not um, the car is stopped in front of them for an illegal purpose. So I need, I think it needs to stop. And I think it needs to stop today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next speaker this evening is David Michael Carter. The Common Council has provided you a copy of Section 3244, Public Comment Period Rule. Are you in agreement with this? Yes, I am. Please state your name and you'll have three minutes. David Michael Carter. Can you hear me okay? Yes. You got good volume? I changed my whole format tonight. The lady right there said she can't have her voice heard. I don't have my voice heard. And he says there's a problem with the statues and the homeless and whatever. What's going on in Utica is caused by the Common Council, the mayor not have been here, Marcus not have been here the last six, seven years when I was here straight, Patrick Johnson, Cassandra Lockwood, Moody's new. And quickly, Moody, the answer on James Street is not more cameras. We have a frustrated black lower income community, shots fired because all the money was dumped on Barrick Street, the Irish Museum, the Adirondack take over the War Memorial, Comets Hockey, and not a dollar was put on South Street or your James Street. I got a quick tangent. My mother was taken from her home Mother's Day last year. This year, 2021, a year later, she has had eight operations, caught the coronavirus by the staff at the Mohawk Valley Health System. And we're Native Indian. She was taken off her property. She was drug medicated, and it's a serious legal issue with the Habikas, taking her properly in her assets, it ties into Cuomo's nursing home scandal, who are the candidates that get there. But back to that gentleman's issue and her issue. My voice should have been heard four or five years ago when I came here four or five years straight. Sweet gave me a jaywalking ticket. That's all the dirt UPT could find on me for my wrongful conviction all these 20-something years. I went to court with the director of advocacy, Gene Hughes. The DA and the public defender were popping rubber bands at their privates. I told them, put your clipboard down, your gun and badge, and let's go to the lot so we can beat the crap out of each other. That's the disrespect I got. And there were five clerks in the booth that would verify this. Back to his issue. You can't keep punishing the homeless. You can't pick on the convenience store Muslims and then run around on WKTV and WIBX how great we are, how giving we are, and caring we are, especially what you did to me. You turned your back on me. I'm a product of my environment. If you dig a little deep, you see there's a whole lot of hurt here. No offense, Marcus, but where were you those four or five years I came here by myself, hiding behind Palmieri? And you didn't fill your dad's shoes. And when your dad was here, he didn't fill those shoes. Uh, if you want to keep this oh. to city business, please don't disparage yes, any city officials. Business. Thank you. I went to Frank to city business. Zeka, yes. I went to McKinsey, and one other. And because they didn't help me, those four were taken out. I went to Brindisi this year. This is my last comment for now. I says, Brindisi, you think you're going to get reelected, but watch this. You are up 2,000 votes. If you don't take care of these senior citizens, watch what happens. And he lost to Claudia Tenney. Claudia Tenney is no great help, no different. But you see what karma is all about. And lastly, I'm on Whitesboro side, where Ariskany Boulevard is. 
Chief Burley didn't do something two days before he had his massive heart attack. I asked him, could you fax some information for me? While he was having his heart attack, I was at the Dollar General being assaulted on camera. That's how Guards Comet is working. A whole lot of people I know caught the coronavirus. Palmieri, Pacenti, Keeler, a whole lot that I reached out to. I gave you a lot of tangents and a lot to chew on, but when I come back in two weeks, you better start addressing my wrongful conviction because the streets are mad and we don't want to see these shots fired continually going off. And Moody, how you're looking, I respect you because I think you know a little bit what's going on. But it's in your hands too, my son. Thank, the people. Thank you, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> Next speaker this evening, Lucretia Hunt. Please approach. Thank you. The Common Council has provided you a copy of Section 3244. I don't know how I can follow this guy. Pub public, <laughs> public comment rule. Do you agree with this? <laughs> Lucretia DeSantis. Hunt. Thank you. Hi. Okay. I didn't even know I was going to speak tonight. I came last night for the zoning because I was concerned about my corner. And I don't know whether they passed or not. All I wanted to know is they make sure that they put that fence and they adhere to what they said they had to do. The sidewalk and two feet in, and I want to make sure because I don't want anybody killed on Bleecker and Kasut. That's my one thing. First of all, your acoustics are lousy over here. <laughs> okay? You're facing one way, we're facing another, and then you don't even, I'm, I'm sorry, Doug, you don't even speak into the thing. Maybe you should put those things on so that we can hear you. All right. So that's what I had to say on that. Okay, I came last night for the zoning. I want to thank Mark Williams, Ed Noonan, Frank, Frankie Miola, Marcus, these are the guys I've talked to, Joe Beatrice this week, because I don't like convenience stores. I have seen what they have done to the neighborhoods. I have lived through this. And the convenience store, the first rule that came out, we put over, I'm gonna say 20 years ago, maybe 10 or 15, with Gene Allen and a few of us from the Neighborhood Watch because it was a lady on Lincoln Ave who bought a house. She had wonderful tenants. And the minute that convenience store came there, there were condoms, there were needles, there was stuff. She lost the tenants and the house. Now we add another thing with these little smoke shops. There's the one on the corner of Mohawk that was the old furniture store. Then right down in the middle of the block, past Caruso's, there's another one. They're not smoking cigarettes because our health rules tells us we shouldn't be smoking cigarettes. What are they smoking? And you've got to say smoke shop so people have to be enticed. I know it's marijuana and whatever else it is. So these have to be controlled. Now, my friend Merceda built, worked her tail off on Rutgers Street for her little coffee shop and sandwich stock. Now, this guy is going to take the M&M, and if it becomes a convenience store, I don't know what's going to happen to that neighborhood. So far, that neighborhood is still good, has a lot of homes. They're well kept. They're not like... This guy was talking about the area and some parts of mine in East Utica that have deteriorated and nobody gives a damn. Something has to happen. Wake up, guys. You're here to do rules for us and to make the city safe. And I don't want to see a convenience store across the street from Merceda who's worked her tail off to have that restaurant, okay? Um, I don't know. I don't want to say anything else. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anthony Salerno, if you could please come forward. Thank you. The Common Council has provided you a copy of Section 3244, Public Comment Period Rule. Are you in agreement with this? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony Salerno. I live at 528 Herkimer Road. And... The issue that I have is the, I, lately it's getting harder and harder for myself and everyone on Herkimer Road to get out of their driveway. And not just because of the uh, construction that's going on now, 
it's because they've painted over half the lines at the corner of Leland Ave coming down towards my house. Um, I grew up here and moved away for 15 years, then I came back 20 years ago. Uh, we never used to have those lines. So all this, what happens is people from Larchmont, they go up to Van Rensselaer and there's only one lane, okay? Then they have to turn left to get onto Leland Ave. So if the Leland Ave left turning lane gets full, the other straight lane could be completely empty. But no one's in it because there's five cars waiting on the uh, east side of Van Rensselaer waiting to make that left-hand turn. And it just gets bottlenecked. I went out the other day and it's, um, I looked to my left, I couldn't see the end of the cars. And I'm 528, which is in the middle of Hortimer Road. I look to my right, to the west, and I can't see the end of the cars. This happens all the time. I've, uh, I've recently retired, so I see it more now. I see it every day, three, four times a day. And we sit, we're trying to get out of the driveway, sometimes for 10, 15 minutes, ridiculous. So either you can put some more lights on Herkimer Road to make it so people can get out of their driveway, so which would be a lot cheaper, is just to take that light at Van Rensselaer, get rid of it, put a stop sign on both sides. So one on Van Rensselaer where you can only make a right, one coming out of big lots, I made a rough diagram here, where you can only make a right, okay? And if they did that, the traffic would flow. And if you got rid of those painted lines from Larchmont to Van Rensselaer. That could all be the left turning lane. I mean, it doesn't seem like it should be such a hard thing to get done. I've talked to Mark about it. He said he mentioned it. Um, I'll leave this and some pictures that I took. I could have taken a lot more, but I just did a few. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to ask about is I know that you guys have been talking about taking the trucks off the Herkimer Road or trying to get all the truck traffic off. Um, the trucks go by, they're huge. They make my house shake, they uh, crack my ceilings. I know it's happened with other people. So my question is, they say, Mark said it's the state that we can't do that, okay? So what's our recourse for people that live on Herkimer Road? Do, do we, um, I take a walk every day from my house down to General Herkimer school area and then back, okay? Do, do we sign a petition and get everybody on Herkimer Road to sign the petition? to say that what the, these trucks are doing to our homes. Uh, and then, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. At what, what point, where do you go from there? If you could bring the materials up uh, to the front, I'll make sure that we scan them. Well, yeah, but I'd like to also take pictures of them so we can scan them into email. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker this evening is Adam McLean. If you can please come up. Thank you. It is McLean, right? Yes. It is, yeah. Okay. Thank you. The Common Council has provided you a copy of Section 3244, Public Comment Period Rule. Are you in agreement with this? Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you. State your name for the record, and you can begin. Adam McLean. Uh, so I'm a resident of South Utica, a fairly recent transplant to the area. Uh, my wife and I have lived here about six years, and uh, I teach up at SUNY Poly. I have a far less serious issue than what everybody else has been talking about. I'm actually here because I uh, have been talking with Congresswoman Friend uh, along with a buddy of mine about the idea of putting a disc golf course in at Roscoe Conkling Park near the Recreation Center. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to come here and advocate on behalf of that. Uh, so disc golf, frisbee golf is a growing sport in central New York. There's a lot of social media surrounding it. Uh, it's a relatively cheap thing to install, uh, you know, under, under 10 grand or so to get, to get a get a, uh, nine holes put in. It's essentially golf rules, but you play it a lot faster and with Frisbees, uh, and it's a lot of fun. And I think it could be something really great for the community. They just put in a course uh, up at the old Air Force Base in Rome. Syracuse has a few. There's one at Herkimer Valley Community College. And I think that having one could be an asset for the community and that people will come here to play it, which would provide economic activity uh, and people coming to the city. And uh, the other nice thing is that the pins for disc golf are easy to remove from the ground and put away in the winter so it wouldn't disrupt the ski area uh, near Valbialis, which I know everyone is, is a big fan of. I don't personally ski, but I know people around here are from the south myself, so I'm not a skier. But 
Um, I'd like you all to consider very seriously the idea of putting this in. Uh, disc golf's a lot of fun, and uh, if anybody has any questions, well, I know I can't answer them now, but I'd be happy to talk to people later. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. And you, are you staying for the rest of the meeting as well? Uh, I can, yeah. Okay, because actually, um, I'm sure some of the other people, but I, I have some questions for you specifically. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Right, yeah, of thank course. You. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, the sixth and final speaker this evening is Brianna Mahoney. Right. The Common Council has provided you a copy of Section 3244, Public Comment Period Rule. Are you in agreement with this? Yes. All right. State your name for the record and you may begin. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brianna Mahoney. Um, I'm with Uptown Theater for Creative Arts. I'm here with some of our other board members, um, co-founder and well, my husband, Jevin Mahoney. He's your Utica native. Um, and Al Schneer, and Malik Johnson, and Ellen Rainey. They just are coming to give support. Um, Uptown is a nonprofit organization that was formed in 2017 to bring programming to Utica and to revitalize the Uptown Theater in South Utica. Um, and on behalf of UTCA and our board and our dedicated community of volunteers, performers, and advocates, I would like to thank the council for supporting the resolution put forth by Councilwoman Friend to approve our organization's application to the New York Main Street grant. <clears throat> We've done the work to prepare for this grant application. We're using a grant writer who has secured and administered multiple Main Street grants in cities and towns across New York, and we believe we're in a good position to put in our request. As outlined in the grants program overview, New York Main Street funds are intended to help establish or expand cultural, residential, or business anchors that are key to local revitalization efforts. The Uptown Theater is the anchor of the South Utica Business District. Its success is pivotal to the future economic vitality of this neighborhood, a catalyst for growth and new opportunities. Any investment in the theater's revitalization is an investment in the potential of the engaged and vibrant community that surrounds and supports it. In 2015, a small theater in the village of Catskill received a New York Main Street grant to fund substantial improvements and open a main stage for live productions. In the time since, the Bridge Street Theater has attracted statewide and regional tourism uh, and encouraged the opening of multiple new complementary businesses within walking distance. This is only one example of the transformative power of an arts and entertainment venue to both its immediate vicinity and the region as a whole. This is the future we envision for the Uptown, for our neighborhood, for Utica. The Uptown was an unutilized treasure for years sitting vacant and decaying, dark and quiet in a city that was otherwise springing to life and brimming with opportunity. Since our organization took over, we've cleaned and cared for the property, repaired and relit the marquee, and introduced two new performance spaces for low cost or free, diverse, and innovative programming. We've replaced flooring, plumbing, electrical, and furniture. We've hired local contractors bought from local companies. We've had businesses donate their services and supplies, and volunteers donate their time to clean, paint, and staff our events. We made sure that our beloved local landmark got the broader recognition it deserved by successfully nominating it to the state and national registers of historic places. We've taught classes to kids, teens, and adults, awakened talents, and connected kindred spirits who might otherwise have never met. We've seen friendships and collaborations develop from performers and participants who see the Uptown as a home for the creative community. We've hosted live music, comedy, theater, spoken word, community forums, writing groups, and movies. We welcome visitors from across the street and across the state. We've done all of this while working within a section of the building that's less than 2,000 square feet, while the 7,000 square foot auditorium remains unusable, with hundreds of seats, a projection room, and a stage. The doors to that auditorium will stay closed until we can fund its renovation. The roof is leaking, the ceiling is crumbling, the systems are not functional. Opening the auditorium will be the turning point for the Uptown, the way it will grow to serve the community and operate as a self-sustaining business. But we can't make that happen without significant funds like those available through New York Main Street and other state and federal resources. While we have been fortunate to receive a few small to medium grants in the past, by and large, the restoration of the theater thus far has been funded by the people of this community who have made gifts small and large because they care deeply about the Uptown's past, present, and future. In the last six weeks, we've raised an additional $40,000 from our members and supporters, and we're only just getting started on our focused capital campaign. 
but to go where we need to go to make the uptown everything it wants to be, we need larger pools of funding, and that means we need your support in this resolution and beyond. Thank you. That is the final speaker this evening. So public comment period is now closed. We do have communications from the mayor this evening. Oh, I have a copy right here, thank you. Uh, this is the mayor's message to the Common Council. This is uh, the mayor's voice speaking, even though I'm reading this letter. Earlier this week, the administration issued a statement in response to media inquiries regarding the funding for the construction of a new parking garage to support the Wynn Hospital of the Mohawk Valley Health System in downtown Utica. To be clear, no other local government entity has invested more to support the hospital project than City of Utica. The city has contributed a total of $6 million of its grant funding that was originally allocated for other purposes towards the construction of the new parking garage. The city suggested and ultimately decided to finance its portion of the parking garage by reallocating these funds. This matter was discussed, negotiated, and finalized with Empire State Development officials, and all parties agreed to the terms. Any public comments to the contrary is political posturing as this issue has been settled. If you're just tuning in, this is the mayor's message to the council. In addition to its reallocation of grant funding for the parking garage, the city made an $8 million investment in infrastructure improvements to ensure the hospital project comes to fruition. It is the administration's position that city residents have paid their fair share for a healthcare facility that will serve as a regional asset. In other updates, the extension for bulk green waste pickup has ended. All green waste materials must be containerized as green waste debris buildup in city culverts can increase the severity of flooding. <laughs> Lastly, the city is in its final stages of completing its LED street lighting installation project. This project in partnership with the New York State Power Authority, NIPA, upgrades the city's infrastructure, saves the city money, and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. That ends the mayor's message to the council. Thank you. Very good. All right. Do we have any miscellaneous communications? We have the City of Utica cash report for May 2021, totaling 59 million point six. Received and filed. Sorry, we're sharing a mic up here. All right, reports from the city officers. Chief Ingersoll, you have the floor. No report tonight. Thank you very much. Corporation Council. All right, thank you very much. Would you like to welcome the new Corporation Council? I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, everyone, this is uh, Stephanie DiGiorgio. Um, she's the newest member of the Corporation Council's office. Um, she'll be joining us part-time. Um, she is specifically assigned to uh, the Zoning Board, I believe it is, Planning Board, Common Council. And, um, yeah, and take, exactly. And taking on a couple of other uh, departments and assignments within our office. Um, I'm sure she'll make herself available to you guys. She's interned in our office before, so we know she's very good um, and she'll get along great with everyone, so we really are happy to have her and I'm sure you guys will be as well. So. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Chief Noonan, Chief Williams, I'm going to uh, save yours for last because you're going to also be giving the report that uh, the council requested. Sure. Okay. Commissioner Thomas, anything to report? Nothing at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Phillips? I'm all set. All right. Chief Williams, Deputy Chief Noonan, you have the floor. I'd also like to uh, just note, I jotted it down, uh, we did have that one public comment speaker request clarification on the panhandling, so if you could also include that, it would be appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you. Let me start off by addressing that. Mr. Julian, the problem with the, the panhandling, it used to be known in, in the law as loitering for purpose of, of begging. That law was deemed unconstitutional by the highest court in New York State, the Court of Appeals. And what they did was they deemed it to be unconstitutional and unenforceable. That's why we cannot make a rest for people begging. And basically, there's a park. The problem we're having is that if people weren't giving money and food to these people, they wouldn't have a venue to be able to collect. What we've been encouraging people to do is rather give to the individual, give to the organizations that, they, that take care of the needy. But unfortunately, because the law restricts our ability to be able to enforce pain handling, there is no law to address it. My question that is, that is you, that can you go after these people that are stopping and giving them the money? 
No, I can't. They're creating a nuisance because, like I said, we're not paying, and you know the law too. What happens? What's the law for vehicle traffic? You hit somebody from the rear. Cause you're right with your head up, you know what? But the re the reality is the person from the rear is responsible. Correct? Am I, am I it's, it could be followed too close. It could be a multitude of things. But the reality is this. The only time we can enforce any type yeah, of gonna... pain handling type of defense is that you're standing in the public right away. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much yes. for that report. Uh, Judge Garamond did have a comment on that that he'd also like to add. I, I want Mr. Julian to know that his complaint has not gone unnoticed by the members of the Common Council. In fact, I was asked to try to prepare some sort of uh, ordinance to correct just what you said. The chief of police is correct. The highest court has declared all those panhandling statutes, and we have federal court decisions that are very strong. New York has, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the commentaries in one of the cases is it is almost improbable, I won't say impossible, that a municipality could pass a law that would meet the criteria of the federal courts. It is so legally complicated that when I researched all these cases, I discussed it with the councilman who was requesting this, and I talked to the chief of police, and I quite frankly, Mr. Julian, not that anybody disagrees with what you're saying, because I live on the parkway, I know what you're talking about, but I've researched this, and quite frankly, I, I don't want them to have an ordinance that's going to be declared by our courts unconstitutional and following all the federal courts. So panhandling is not the simple matter you think it is. It is a very complicated legal matter. And therefore, uh, I didn't draw that ordinance. Because, uh, <clears throat> frankly, I, I read those cases. I, I, I don't think it's really possible. That's the way the federal courts look at it. That's the way the state courts follow the federal courts. And, and uh, we have state decisions, too. And quite frankly, no use doing something that you know is going to be a failure because the law against that type of ordinance is very strong. That's all I have to say, Mr. President. Thank you. Good. All right. Actually, you know, I have a comment on this. And I'd like to ask Corporation Council and the Police Department to look into this, because I just thought of something that may sound bizarre when I say it, um, as you guys were talking about this. Um, can you please look into possibly deeming panhandling uh, as an operating business under the vending permits. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but I would like to look into it to see if you could permit it. Because if you could permit permit that as a business and set the permit fee, like we do for all other businesses, such as 1250 a year, so on and so forth, that might give us grounds to get people off the streets from panhandling because it won't be a business. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't want to talk about it, but I just, I just thought of it randomly is, is thinking of how impossible this would be, so just, just think about it. Mr. President, yeah. can I ask a question? Okay. Can I ask a question? The one thing I, I ask of you guys, and is, is it possible, because I've had this problem, the judge, he's speaking of me when I asked him to write something, and I've talked about a permit also. Is there any possible way, I mean, we had to go in North Utica and turn the power off in the winter because they took a space heater and were plugging into where we plug in the Christmas lights. There's numerous damage, I mean, not damage, uh, garbage and litter all over the place. Isn't there any way, like in North Utica, we have the same guy there. He's there every day. He kind of laughs at me because I told him, you want to stand here, pick up your mess. I've picked this stuff up. We can't cite these guys for littering or any of that stuff when it's there, loitering. I mean, there's none of, none of that. that I, I'm just asking the question. That's, there, there can be. Here's the situation. Regarding litter, we'd have to actually catch them in the act of actually dispose of them. It's not always that easy. However, you know, we do have zone cars. Your main, your main priority is to respond to calls for service. If you try to be proactive, I'm crying. But 
you know, when possible, yeah. I mean, you know, certainly other officers, right. you I might mean, want to try, try to enforce it. I mean, I understand where Mr. Julian's coming from because I've had the same, you guys know, I've talked to both of you, the judge. I mean, it's the same guy that's there every day. Well, you know what the problem is? We look at the problem is the situation. people giving the money. Well, it, it, that's 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 a big problem. But here's the problem: we look at the homeless problem. We can't always make this a police issue. Right. This is a social issue. And when we talk about the homeless, when we talk about the homeless, we're dealing with a whole host of other problems. There's mental health. There's substance abuse. So the problem is to make, not to make the police a push room to get rid of the problem. The problem is to get these people from these organizations like substance abuse. And mental health to get out in the field and do field work directly with these people. Because until you do that, this is not going to be a police solution. It has to be a social, right. a, a social. Right. Thing. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Just to follow up on the chief said, we have partnered with United County Social Services on a regular basis. We go out with a caseworker, reach out to the individuals, offer them services, mm -hmm. advising that you know if they are going to do this, not to go up the wrong way. But um, you know, we, so we're being proactive. Thank you. One of the programs we do have in place is a crisis intervention team. We're one of the first in Atlanta County to have such a team. We are pairing up one of our police officers on a full-time basis with a clinical social worker from the mobile crisis assessment team. They're going out daily doing, trying to do preventative police work rather than wait for a crisis to happen. So we are working with the homeless population as well. All right, so Councilman Moody, you requested the floor, and then I'd like to have them get to the report that we wanted during the caucus meeting. Yeah, I, I just want to. I just wanted to say I agree. We have these issues on Oneida Square. I just want to make sure that anything that we draft is not punitive. I don't want to write a law um, um, uh, making criminal being poor. That's all. Mm -hmm. All right. So your report. Thank you. You know the. Uh, homicide the homicide. Yeah, the uh, report yeah, from the. Before I just want to address one other speaker, Mr. Slurno, regarding uh, Herkimer Road. There have been two studies we've done with the state DOT, because it is a state designated road. Um, and there's been, as a result of that, there's been changes to the Herkimer Road. We'd be willing to work with you again to see if we can help that situation. But what they have said in the past is we're seeing an increase of the volume of cars on that roadway, which is complicating the problem. Are you talking about the bottleneck, or are you talking about the trucks? The now, the trucks is a separate issue. Even though it's a state route, which you may not be aware of this, it's been designated federally as a federally truck route, which means that we can't prevent these trucks from going onto Herkimer Road. And when you deal with these trucking companies, they'll always take the, the route that's going to be less mileage to save money, because based on the weight of what they're wearing. Well, when they extended the arterial, yeah. uh, they put the Leland Ave access, which basically, basically made it worse. They put everything going on. From Leland, it just made it worse. And there's always cause and effect, but we'd be willing to work with you. But we'll, you know, we'll do another traffic study with DLT, and we'll, direct, we'll work directly with you. I mean, what I gave you, I mean, that's not, I don't think that's very, that should be that hard to do. Basically, remove one light, a couple stop signs, and open up that lane that was painted. Yeah, the, the, the traffic light, I have to talk with the, the fire chief on that, but they may need that light there to be able to get out of their firehouse. But I, I grew up here. In all due respect, you probably remember from a different time when there's less vehicles on the road. It's it's a different ball game now, but again, we'll be willing to work and see what we can do to help you out. Okay. Yep. Um, I had a couple of council people, including yourself, uh, ask me about what's been going on with our shootings and homicides here in the city of Utica, and I can tell you right now, we are not alone with the problems that are going throughout the state. Now, there's been recent uh, conversations with police executives all over the state. I'm talking to upstate, and what we're finding is that with the passing, aggressive passing of police reform and criminal reform laws, it's causing a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now. Raise the age, bail reform, discovery, just to name a few. And not that we as chiefs are against these type of reforms. It's the way they were passed without any input into it at all. We agree there should be some type of bail reform. There should be some type of discovery. But when you don't get the input of all the parties involved, you start seeing cause and effect that can go bad. Now what we're seeing throughout the state, and I just got the figures today 
from the Division of Criminal Justice Services. Right now, compared to last year, year to date, we are seeing the amount of shooting victims in the state an increase of 44.4%. Those individuals killed by gunfire, it's an increase of 54.7%. The cities there are really being impacted a lot worse than us are Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and Niagara Falls. From our standpoint, where we stand year to date, is that last year we had at this time, uh, at this time we had uh, for the year we had the ten year to date victims that were shot as a result of gunfire. This year we're up to twelve. And what's scary is that the amount of guns that are our men and women are coming across on the street. We have a unit called the uh, crime prevention unit had done an outstanding job getting guns off the street and believe me it is no easy task when you're dealing with armed individuals where officers have to make split-second decisions in chaotic situations any one of these can go wrong and become national news like we've seen across this country to the credit of the officers they've used enormous restraint and we've taken 31 handguns off the street in just a short period of time What's disturbing what we're seeing is our gun offenders are getting younger and our victims are getting younger. And a lot of that is due to the fact that now with raise the age, they're not charged as adults. They're, they're going through the family court system. A lot of these kids are not being placed. And what's disturbing the most about the raise the age religious legislation, when we talked to represent, representatives from the state years ago, when they say they were gonna do this, they promises that, they, that there are going to be services in place that, that treat these kids. The services are not there. And that's the frustrating part. So when we look at the gun violence problem in the city of Utica, we just don't look at it from a, a, a standpoint of just enforcement. We are working directly with Patrick Johnson and a lot of the, you know, the leaders in the black community to help us do outreach in addition to the enforcement end of it. What we use is real-time um, data and, uh, and evidence-based solutions to try to find out who the known gun offenders are, target those gun offenders in the locations where they're likely to, likely to offend. And to the, the credit of our grunt, uh, crime prevention unit, they have done a great job. Now, homicides for the year. Last, last year, we had three homicides at this point. We're up to two. Any homicide is way too much, uh, in my opinion. Uh, some of the frustrations that we deal with when it comes to the uh, investigations into these shootings, a large majority of the victims that are shot know who their offender are and they won't cooperate. They don't want to be known as snitches, uh, snitches nor do they want uh, the police to solve their problem. They want street, their own street justice. And it isn't just gangs, it's sometimes it's over petty beefs that we're seeing. A 16-year-old girl was shot over a relationship by a 17-year-old recently and you know it, it's disturbing when you see the reasons why these young men and women are getting shot so I, I know David Michael Carter spoke about cameras on James Street well I, thank God those cameras were on James Street because the recent homicide that we had in the barber shop in the corner of James and Seymour the reason why that was partially solved is that we got the plate number of the, the vehicle that drove away on the, off the pole camera that was there so those cameras are critical to today's strategies when it comes to fighting gun violence because you need that technology. In comparison to other cities, they dwarf us in the amount of cameras that are out there uh, when it comes to poll cameras for you know, enforcement purposes. Listen, the public can certainly videotape the police. It's a public venue, and we have to accept that, and we can't stop them. And likewise, in a public venue, we can also have surveillance of, of, of citizens in a public venue. So unless you have anything to add, no. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to address them. You were the one who kind of led this uh, yeah, from the um, caucus. Yeah, the, the, the main thing is um, many in the community, and like you said, coming forward, is that um, some feel that we have these homicides and, and that there is no justice on the part. And you mentioned that it is partly cooperation. But um, that is something that many in the community are trying to work around. There is, you know, as you know, trust issues and all of that aspect there. 
So what is the solution then, knowing that we still have work to do with building a strong community police relationship? Is it more camera surveillance? You know, I led the initiative for the um, uh, well, blue light districts now to correspond with the youth council. But it is, is that an answer? I know you also talked about um, shots fired uh, uh, systems, but that was a bit pricey. And we have a, uh, money coming down the pipe now. Um, is that something to look at uh, with the shots fired systems and stuff that we that you all talked about? And you know the, the frustration of these effect, these investigations. It, it's it's many reasons why they don't cooperate. Fear is one of them. Some people look at it as that why should I become a witness when the person who was shot doesn't even want to cooperate with the police? So that becomes a problem. I mean, this, to give you an example of a recent shooting in the head. You know, we get a shooting scene, uh, we get a, a person that drives himself up to the hospital after being shot, right? Gives us the wrong location where he was shot. Doesn't want any police assistance and won't tell us who did it. I mean, in, the, in the case of the 17 year old, her family was telling her as she was on the ground bleeding not to cooperate with the police. And the other thing about that same shooting with the with 16 year old that got shot, what disturbed me, I started getting phone calls from residents complaining that we were certain. Our officers were searching that girl while she was down on the ground, uh, bleeding. And what the officers did, she had two puncture lungs. They applied trauma seal patches to her chest that doctors later credited officers who potentially saved their life. So some of the faults in there that are out there is not helping us be able to do our job. And I look at it this way. When it comes to our shooting, we're not going to rest our way out of this problem. There has to be a community solution, and a community has to be involved working with the police. Otherwise, this is going to continue. Yeah. Well, also, to your, to your question, Councilman, I think the Chief and I have spoken, and we felt, feel that money would be better spent on cameras as opposed to shot spotter. Shot spotter has been used in other cities throughout the state, but it it's, hasn't been that Cameras best. would be. Cameras have helped us tremendously. Yeah. I'm what good. the cameras also do, when you don't have witnesses that are willing to come forward or afraid to come forward, the best witness to them is the camera. You can use that information where we could possibly identify that who the shooter is or maybe the vehicle that they left in. The yeah, expectation today from, from juries and courtrooms is what they see on TV is they want physical evidence. Physical evidence. They want the case handed to them on a, on a platter. They want to see what happened. That, that, that camera really, really helps us. Thank you. Thank you. Is it all, uh, does that conclude not only the report, but Councilman Moody? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Because that was kind of their yeah. guest discussion on top of the report. Okay, do you have anything else to report this evening? That's it. All right, so that concludes reports from the city officers. Before we move on to petitions, remonstrances, and appeals, I'd like to thank everyone who did come to the meeting to uh, for sticking around. Typically, when people have public comment, they run out after. And then they don't, uh, you know, see a lot of the responses. Uh, the other reason I'm speaking right now is that I've allowed a little bit more interaction from the gallery with the council members and the department heads um, this evening, and that's in part uh, because this is only I think the second or third time the public's back in the meeting. We're together again, and people are fielding some questions. Uh, but uh, moving on for the rest of this meeting, and as we move on with public meetings. The gallery um, is welcome to stay to the end of the meeting to interact with the department heads and or the council people after the fact. So petitions, remonstrances, and appeals. First district, council member, and majority leader, Maria McNeely, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I have nothing this evening. Thank you very much. Second district, Councilman Burmaster, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I, uh, I like to... Uh, uh, bring out ordinance number six. It's uh, intersection where stop required. Ordain that section 2-16, 358 Schedule C, intersections where stop required be amended to include the following. Highland Ave and Downer Ave, Northeast Corner, Highland Ave and Downer Ave, Southwest Corner, be it further ordained that the proper signage be erected when where necessary. Wait a second. Wait a second from Miola. Your votes. <coughs> Nine is adapting. Uh, 
Uh, that's all I have this time, but, but thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Third District, Council Person Friend, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to say, uh, first, I just want to make a comment about um, COVID. You know, yesterday, the, we reached 70% in the state. People were very excited. A lot of the restrictions have been lifted, which was great. Uh, the state decided to light up a bunch of buildings throughout the state and to set off fireworks. I was excited and pleased and happy, and I said so on social media. And then I was reminded by a constituent, um, and I'm really grateful that he reminded me of this, uh, that children under the age of 12 can't be vaccinated yet, and that means those children and their families are still sort of under more restrictions than the rest of us, and I, I'm just glad to be reminded of that, to not to sort of simply think it's over. All those families still have to worry about their children, still have to take special precautions for their children, etc. and I think it's really important to remember that. So um, with that, I would like to bring out, Mr. President, resolution number five. Just the second I find it. Uh, so this is uh, a resolution approving and endorsing Uptown Theater for Creative Arts as applicant for the Uptown <coughs> Theater renovations projects in its application to New York State Homes and Community <coughs> Renewal for funding under the New York Main Street Program for Downtown Anchor Building renovations. Whereas the future prosperity of our city depends in part on the success of our cultural and artistic institutions, and whereas the Uptown Theater for Creative Arts as applicant desires to apply for $500,000 in financial assistance through the 2021 consolidated funding application under the New York Main Street Program for Downtown Anchor Building Renovations, and whereas the application proposes funding to assist the Uptown Theater for Creative Arts to complete building renovations to this downtown anchor building at 2014 Genesee Street in the city of Utica, and whereas the proposed funding will contribute to an ongoing community revitalization effort, and whereas the grant application requires that the applicant obtain the approval and endorsement of the governing body of the municipality in which the project will be located, now therefore be it resolved that the Common Council of the City of Utica approves and endorses the 2021 New York Main Street Program for Assistance prepared and to be submitted by Uptown Theater for Creative Arts as, applic as applicant. We have a second. Now, during caucus, we were talking about the one that we're going to deal with no at the next meeting. Right. Now, we're requesting our clerk to hold this until that we finalize it. Okay, so you're, you're making a motion to put this in committee? No, no I'm making a motion to pass this tonight. Oh, okay, she's going to hold it. Okay, okay. Um, now, so uh, I don't have anything more to say in, in support of this. Uh, Ms. Mahoney has said enough. But did we decide that we were going to go full council on this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're going to go full council on this. Thank you. Your votes. She's got it. Nine, nine E's adopted. Thank you very much. And I, I do, I do just want to, I, I do want to say one important thing, uh, which is that Devin and Brianna Mahoney are an incredible asset to this community, not just to South Utica but to Utica. I'm so glad they came back. Um, they've worked really hard and and then got hit by COVID. Um, they've worked hard. They've made personal sacrifices. Um, and I'm incredibly glad to have them both as constituents and as business owners in the city of Utica. Thank, Thank you. you. Now I would like to bring out ordinance number 10, please. So this is a no parking at all times ordained that section 2-16-360 schedule E, no parking at all times, be amended to include the following. Hazelhurst Avenue, west side from Maryline Avenue to a point in front of 947 Hazelhurst Avenue, be it further ordained that the proper signage be erected where necessary. Unless, um, unless you're claiming this is time sensitive, the judge. M motion to waive you. that there is a Exactly, room. yes, thank you. Thank you. No, no, absolutely. Uh -oh. Yeah. You could I claim it's time sensitive. I love. Is there a the, second on that? I love the Thursday rule. Okay, any opposed to waiving the Thursday rule? It's waived. Okay. Now I need a second. I thought she said. I thought she second. No, for other legislation. Up top. Oh, okay. All right. Here with me. Thank you. Who seconded the legislation? 
All right, Lamedico. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> Who seconded first? Yes. Uh, Councilman Williams, I think you turned your mic on. There you go. Sorry. 90s adopted. Thank you, Mr. President. That's all I have this evening. Sorry, we're jockeying the microphone up here. We got everything all dis dis disheveled. All right. Fourth District and Councilman Pro Temp, Frank Mioli of the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would like to make a motion to waive the Thursday rule. Uh, please accept my apologies on this legislation being late, Council. It's seconded by Beatrice. If you guys could turn those mics on when you're talking, that'd be great. Thank you. I second it. All right, any opposed to waiving the Thursday rule for this set of legislation? We're good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to move legislation ordinance number 10, an ordinance est establishing a temporary moratorium on our convenience stores and smoke shops in the city of Utica for not less than six month period, but may be extended. Whereas the Common Council of the City of Utica did on November 4, 2020, um, February 3rd, 2021, adopt new legislation designed to regulate what is referred to convenience stores and smoke shops and their locations in the City of Utica. Whereas since the adoption of the new zoning law on February 3rd, 21, new questions have arisen in regard to the terms and application of these entities. And whereas to be determined by the Common Council that these or new ordinances refer further study and possibly revision of nece necessity and moratorium to be enacted and what halt the approval of such entities for a period of time to allow for a study to be conducted. Now be a further ordained the common council the urban I'm sorry that the commissioner of urban renewal and economic development and planning board and zoning board of appeals not issue a any permission for development or establishment of any new convenience stores or smoke shops for a period not less than six months for the effective date of this ordinance and they recognize that the moratorium and such for not less than six months following the effective date of this ordinance such moratorium may be extended for such study and may not be completed by the end of the six month period we have a second second Ms. williamson your votes 90s adopted. Mr. President, we will be working diligently to make our codes, uh, zoning legislation up to compliance. Um, all of our council members will be attending the meeting. Of course, the head of our codes department, Marcus Phillips, will have his um, um, recommendations for us. And so will Bill, um, Brian Thomas. And I'd like to state that the idea for this moratorium did not come from me. It came from Brian Thomas. So uh, I got to give him credit. I beat him up last council meeting. So I just like to not, you know, give him a little credit where credit is due. And thank you very much, council. All right. Thank you. Fifth district, Councilman Moody, the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to uh, just talk briefly. I, I've been getting a lot of calls um, about Oneida Square, and um, I think the next step for me is to do an sort of emergency task force to figure out what we can do. We have two competing problems there. We have an issue with the uh, corner stores, and then we have the uh, uh, admirable work of uh, 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 the church there with providing shelter and warming centers for the homeless. Um, but that being said, it is an amalgamation, if you will, of problems, and uh, we need to figure out something uh, we need to figure out something that is going to drastically address the issue. It will be uncomfortable. It will probably not make everybody happy, but I'm willing to step out and do what I have to do to make sure that we can preserve the integrity and the niceness of Oneida Square and make sure that Oneida Square does not become Utica Skid Row. I'll refuse to let that happen, and, um, and uh, I'm willing to stand up to do that. So. We will work on Oneida Square. I just got about five calls this past week, literally, um, from constituents all up to college presidents about the issue there on Oneida Square. Um, but that's being said, Mr. President, I want to um, move ordinance number seven, no parking at all times, rescinded, ordained that section 216, 360, schedule lead, no parking at all times, Brinkerhoff Avenue, east side from Arthur Street to Point South southerly of uh, Roosevelt School property line 
Brinkerhoff Avenue East Side, front of Roosevelt School property. Brinkerhoff Avenue East Side from southern property line of Roosevelt School to James Street. Brinkerhoff Avenue West Side between Rutgers Street, James Street. Brinkerhoff Avenue West Side between Rutgers Street and Arthur Street be rescinded. Second. Uh, motion to waive Thursday rule. Waive. Okay. Yeah. You didn't come first before the legislation, but that's okay. Okay, we had a second from Lomatico. Any opposed? It's waived. It's waived for the evening. At this Thank point. you, Mr. President. Because you're waiving it <laughs> generally. You're not waving it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Downhill from here, people. I can see it. Don't be. Second for the actual legislation from DeBrango. Your votes to rescind this parking legislation. All right, 98. Stopped it. Next piece. Um, ordinance number eight, no parking at all times of the day, section 216, 360 says leave no parking at all times. Be amended to include the following Brinkerhoff Avenue West Side between South Street and Arthur Street. Brinkerhoff Avenue West Side between James Street and Pleasant Street be it further ordained that the proper signage be erected where necessary. Your votes, or yeah, second from you all. Your votes, throw them up there. Thank you. One more. It <coughs> Two more. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Nine days adopted. Mm -hmm. All right. I'd like to move from the table local law um, number one of 2021, designating Juneteenth as a public holiday. Local law establishing June 19th, Juneteenth as a public holiday in the city of Utica, New York. Second. Okay, we have a second from friend. Any opposed for, you know, to taking that from the table? All right, it's on the table. No. Or it's taken from the table, sorry. It's on the floor. Uh, no, you can uh, summarize. You can summarize this, please. Um, <laughs> stick with the appropriate whereas and the therefore be it enacted. That's the actual law part of that. The section yeah, one. In its entirety, the uh, whereas. The section one you need to read in its entirety. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> whereas Juneteenth is the day that celebrates the liberation of over a quarter million African Americans in the state of Texas, the last state in which the Emancipation Proclamation was to be enforced and therefore being enacted by the Common Council for the City of Utica, Section 1, Section 112 of the Utica City Code shall be amended to read as follows. Public holidays designated public holiday include the following days in each year. The first day of January, known as New Year's Day. The third Monday in January, known as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. The 12th day of February, known as Ab Lincoln's birthday. The third Monday in February, known as Washington's birthday, the last Monday in May, known as Memorial Day, the second Sunday in June, known as Flag Day, the 19th day of June, known as Juneteenth, the fourth day of July, known as Independence Day, <clears throat> the first Monday of September, known as Labor Day, the second Monday of October, known as Columbus Day, the 11th day of November, known as Veterans Day, the fourth Thursday in November, known as Thanksgiving Day, the 12th the 25th day of December known as Christmas Day and if any such day except Flag Day is Sunday, the next day thereafter and each general election day and each day appointed by the President of the United States or by the Governor of this state as a day of general thanksgiving, general fasting and prayer or other general religious observance. Half, f half holiday includes the period from noon to midnight of each Saturday which is not a public holiday. Mr. President, I'd like to see if um, I'd like to sponsor it also. I don't know if my colleagues so full would council. I? Yeah. It was full council. Full council. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Your votes. It's on the floor. Nine yeas. Thank you Passed. all. I really appreciate that. I think it's an historical uh, thing for our city to have this holiday recognized in our charter. That's so all, Mr. B procedural note, I just want to let everyone know, uh, this is a local law, so the mayor will now be scheduling a public hearing uh, prior to his uh, decision on uh, whether or not to sign it or veto it. Thank I, you. I think it's on the Senate floor anyway. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's going to get passed. So it's not right. right. But there will be a public hearing on this. Thank you. All right. That's it? That's all, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you. you. Sixth District. Joe Beatrice, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. So I'd like to uh, propose uh, ordinance number two, three, <coughs> and four be put into committee. Okay. Okay. Let me get over to those here. 
All right, there's a motion to uh, move ordinance two, three, and four as read and discussed in pre-meeting caucus slash committee of the whole in second. the committee. We have a second from Miola. Oh, uh, he has his hand up, sorry. He's always, he's always beating you guys to it. He's up there. Yeah. So any opposed to placing those in committee? Okay, they're in committee. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next, I'd like to uh, comment on, on two of our speakers tonight. Uh, Mr. Julian, I want to thank you. Is he, I'm not sure if he's still there. I want to thank you very much for uh, giving your input, and I, I feel with you uh, very much because I'm going through the uh, same, I have the same issue in North Utica, and my biggest issue is I have no problem with the panhandlers being out there. I have the problem with the littering and not taking care of the property. I've, you know, I've personally cleaned up the property. I've talked to the gentleman there and just asked him, if you're going to stay here, I know it's the law. I, I'm not trying to take, you know, hurt anybody's hardship or anything like that. But if you're going to stand out on our property, please clean it. That's where my biggest issue is. Um, in Mr. Salerno, um, I am going to get with my fellow councilman. I'm not sure. Is he still here? Nope. He left? Okay. Um, I'm going to come up with a resolution to the state authority for Herkimer Road. I'm sure all you guys helped me before in the past. This is an nope. issue. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, you know, you've heard it from me over and over, and Mr. Salerno knows. I've went to the chief and deputy chief with that same map that he had, and they explained how they've already did a traffic study. We are having Herkimer Road <clears throat> all paved right now, so this is a perfect time that if we were going to do, you know, any restriping or restructuring anything, um, you know, they're going to have to paint the lines on the road now because it's going to be a new road anyway. So... I'm gladly going to work with them, work with you guys, and uh, we, we have a serious problem there. We all know it, and it's kind of like uh, when I had the press, the, uh, the meeting with the state, and you're right, it's a federal access highway, we, and it's like they use the same rhetoric all the time, where we have three roads that run parallel to this road, and we should be able to do something about it, and unfortunately, they use that, it's a state access highway, you can't do anything about it. And I, I think his idea, and I'm going to get with him, Mark, I know you know um, <clears throat> his number very well, but I think he might be on the right path where we go up and down Herkimer Road with all of us and get signatures and come up with a petition um, to do something there uh, because there is, there is no answer, and, and, and it, it's just a terrible thing. I'm, I'm glad that we are getting the road paved. That should help a lot of it. Um, hopefully we get the end of it done next year. Um, but that's, uh, that's all I have. And then, uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, a special person tonight who, um, it's my mother, um, tomorrow she's 81 years old. Um, Hang on, Joe. I got, I got that picture for you. So I was hoping to bring her here tonight and she's, things aren't going very well with her right now. So I just want to say one thing. Uh, I am what I am today because of my mother. My father passed when I was seven years old, and she, ra she raised me all alone. She taught me, she taught me, she made me the person that I am today. She taught me how to be, don't be a baby, don't cry. One thing I remember, I was the youngest kid on the block, and I'd come home and say, I'm getting picked on, and she'd put, and then I'd want to go back out in 20 minutes, and she'd put me in the window and watch the kids play, and she'd break my chops and say, kids, Joey can't come out breaking me, telling me to teach me that if you're going to go out and play, you're not going to come in here and cry. So just just different things. You know, my, my dad was, uh, he was a, 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 the president of the Young Republicans as a young age with, you know, people like John Buckley and Russell Tiny Williams and Bob Spatuzzi. And, you know, I can remember her hosting party, you know, meetings at, at my house. And it's just, uh, it's a terrible, terrible thing to see this lady go as a healthy 81 year old lady and I hope she's not listening because she doesn't realize it but to to really struggling right now with you know knowing who she is and memory and all that stuff and uh, I'm really heartbroken and I just want to wish her a happy birthday and I love you mom I wish you were here so um, let, let, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's all I have that's all I have tonight mr. president thank you okay thank you Council at Large and Minority Leader. Mark Williamson, you have the floor. Uh, well, I'm going to follow that one. I know. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> All right. Uh, resolution number one. 
uh, authorizing the sale of wine and beer in Handshake City. Whereas the sale of alcoholic beverages in possession of an open container containing alcohol beverages is prohibited on the Utica City streets, sidewalks, playgrounds, parks, and right away by ordinance of the Common Council, except in certain instances where permission is granted by the Common Council. Now, therefore, be resolved that the permission to sell beer and wine, exemption, exemption from provisions of Section 2 15 43, Subdivision C, 1, 2, and 3, regarding open containers of alcoholic beverages, is granted to Handshake City. Barks and Brews, Sunday, June 27, 2021, from 12 to 4 p.m. Location event, 26 White Pro Street, Utica, New York. Second for Miola, your votes. Nine is adopted. And I have one thing to pass, and we're mentioning, you know, with the crime in the city and stuff, and I work in a high school, and, you know, Joe brought it up. I think a lot of this stuff come, starts from home. I think, you know, home is the key. You know, the parents have to take a little more ownership of their kids, you know, doing all this stuff. And I, I think it starts at home. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Council Arch, Jack Lemedico, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first of all, the, the Mahoney's left, but I'd like to thank them for everything they've done with the Stanley. I think the... Stanley. Or the Uptown, excuse me. I think the first time I ever went to a <coughs> movie was, I think, to see the birds at the Uptown. Nice. And I still remember it. It was a very, it was a very scary day. <laughs> but uh, but God bless them. It, it is a treasure in our city, and, uh, and uh, I will back them as much as I can as a councilman to, uh, to get that CFA money to them, and uh, hopefully they will get it. And um, I thank the, uh, the rest of the council here for... Uh, agreeing with uh, Councilman Friend on that. I think it was a great idea to, to push this along and, and, and to just hopefully they'll get that. Uh, on a little darker note, uh, I have to thank uh, Chief Williamson, Deputy Chief Noonan. Uh, Williamson. Williamson, what did I say? Master Chief, I'm not a chief. Uh, whatever your name is. So, and, and, uh, and Marcus, because uh, there, there is a problem at Oneida Square and uh, I've sat down with them, I've sat down with the mayor, and uh, they do have a plan right now that they're working. Uh, right now, they're, they're, there's a, uh, uh, they have these outreach teams. Uh, I think a lot of these, uh, these uh, programs out there, they always expected you to come to them, you know, like ACC and Insight House and, and Helio, you know, it was like, yeah, sure, we'll see you. You know, you gotta come at 7, 7.30 tonight. Well. The, the, the type of people that are, that are at the, uh, the Cornerstone Church that uh, Pastor Bauman is, is, is working with, um, they're not the type of people that are going to show up at 7 o'clock every day uh, to a, uh, a drug meeting or a mental health counseling. These, these are people that are there that have been kicked out of Johnson Park, they've been kicked out of the rescue mission, they've been kicked out of the different areas because they don't, their, their issues go well beyond a structured environment. That's why they're living on the street. That's why they're doing what they're doing. And so I commend um, Pastor Bowman. I, I, think he, I think unfortunately it got a little bigger than he thought it was gonna happen. I think maybe um, he recognized it and, and I sat with him a couple months ago and I was working with the mayor. We were able to get him some uh, uh, Care Act money to help him in that, and uh, but he he saw it. The mayor certainly saw it, and the city officials certainly saw that there was a real issue there. And uh, now we have these, as as the chief was mentioning, now we have these organizations that are going out there, uh, these outreach programs, including the police, um, including all the the mental health uh, organizations in the city. And uh, they also, another thing that they're doing over there is they also have a van that uh, they're picking some of these uh, homeless people there and they're actually letting them work uh, within the city and the city's giving them some uh, vouchers, money, get, giving Pastor Bowman a, a voucher where he could actually pay these people so they could actually get a little structure into their life. Um, it's not that we don't have rooms for these people. These people choose, a lot of them, not to want to go into a structured home. So this is where the mental health counseling comes in. 
Uh, this is where to find out who these people are, where they came from. And this is all being done now, but it's going to take a, you know, some, some patience and, and uh, with, the, with the residents there. And, uh, and, the, and the residents there have had a lot of patience. Uh, I wouldn't want to live there to, to see what's going on there right now. So I, 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 I thank the people there that are living in that area to have, and, and to put up what they uh, they have put up with, but uh, have a little more patience. Uh, I think, Chief, uh, you guys are supposed to get together next week, all the different organizations, and figure out, uh, you know, which is a good thing. You know, when you when you put people out there, and and you set a plan, you got to come back and see if your plan is working. And this is the first thing they're going to meet next week to see if the plan is working and what other. Uh, changes they can make to it and and then move on from there so I think uh, I thank the mayor for r recognizing this I think that for all the organizations that are involved in this to take care of this issue but it's not going away you know this issue started in months uh, uh, in, in another park wasn't it uh, uh, we had the same problem in Martin, Martin and they're just they're just moving them around one of the other things that I think Pastor Bowman and, and the city is having a problem with this too. Is that when you have an, uh, when you have a program where you could just go in and and, uh, and go to sleep and, and leave like eight of, you know seven o'clock in the morning and then you're on your own. You're going to get people from other counties to hear about it. Hey, listen, I got a place I could lay my head down. So we're getting a lot of other people from outside the county and outside the city. They're hearing about this. And that's one of the issues why this is getting bigger than, than I think the pastor had figured to begin with. So we have to figure out what, what to do with these people that are coming out from the outside of the district that are actually taking advantage of this. Um, you know, we can't kick them out. You know, we have no say. You know, we can't, we can't send you to Syracuse and a week back you're here from Syracuse. We, you know, we, we can't kick you, out, kick you out of the city. So we have to deal with this. And hopefully, uh, you know, we get a handle on it and... Uh, We'll see in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll see how things are going. But once again, I wish everybody had a little patience. Uh, these people are, are, are broken, you know, they, they, uh, and, and they need fixing. And I think uh, I commend the city again and everyone else involved for, for tackling this. And, and uh, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Council at Large, Frank Branco, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't think there's any legislation left for me. They finally took care of it for you. Right. Right. But, uh, yeah, I, I got to agree with Councilman uh, Lamedico. It, it's not only in our city. It's a national crisis, state crisis. It's all these cities are experiencing homelessness all over the place. And uh, I, I'm, I'm satisfied that some action is going to be taken. It is being taken now. And hopefully, like, you know, we can get it under control or somewhat under control because it is it's not a good sight. I was, I was driving by Steuben Park and I see a woman with a blanket and all her little food around her and she's laying right in the middle of the park in the, in the, in the, in the light of day so it's just uh, it's a sad sight to see and hopefully uh, you know we, we can get a handle on it um, as far as getting those guns off the street I mean I read it I read it in the news and, and uh, uh, those uh, those people that are out there and putting their lives in danger and, and trying to frisk somebody with a gun I just saw a video I think uh, yep. Um, Councilman Williamson sent it out. No, he that said, was Chief Williams. Oh, Chief Chief Williams, I'm where Chief. Uh, you know the gentleman's walking with a with a hoodie on, and, and it's split second. The officer tells him to get his hands out of his pocket. And he takes his hands out, and he, and he fires, and he hits two officers in a matter of a split second. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, they they did take him down uh, and return fire. But he hit two officers in a matter of a split second. So uh, to approach anybody in a vehicle in the dark of night or anybody in an alley or whatever, I mean, and they're putting their lives on the line and, and more so than ever. So I, I can't thank them enough. And, and getting these guns off the street, it just seems like they just got more and more and more. And I don't know where they get them all, but we're doing a good job and, and at least um, being proactive. Um, and last but not least, I just want to say happy birthday to Mrs. Beatrice. Hopefully she enjoys the rest of the night and uh, the days ahead. Thank you. I have Thank a saber on. What's that? I have a saber, or I have something. Yeah, yeah, I have a little Before something too. So you have the floor. I think we should start with uh, with uh, Oneida Square about 
the times when these things are these places are open we need to really i think a lot of issues are coming late at night i think we need to bring close them at a certain time during the night we talked about this for a year i think the time has come where we this is where we got to start doing it we got to i mean that the most of your issues are late at night right usually morning. on there morning if you look at the three community stores that's the draw for all the, the bad activity we're seeing there yes so selling th synthetic substances that they're that people are consuming that's causing these are they open all night they're uh, open to about open midnight one o'clock it's not some yeah. these are, are arising at night and then what you're seeing is like a bird is the after that yeah the next morning I think everybody can agree when we were growing up a lot of these corner stores were they closed at nine ten o'clock and uh, nine o'clock usually and then they open at seven o'clock in the morning you know can they don't stay open at two o'clock in the morning there's no reason why um i believe you I'm guys are going to have a meeting on this you know, I just, correct I know. All right. james street was quiet and he didn't have any remarks all zalatan everybody closed mirrors they all closed at 9 30 at night Friday, Saturday it didn't make a difference. They just closed down, and James Street was quiet. That's all Is that I all? Say. All right, thank you. All right, um, Councilman Williamson had previously waived his time. That's why I gave him the floor again. Um, I have one thing, and this actually uh, is, is uh, in response to something that's been in the media, but also I was speaking with council people, and I did state that I would address this uh, because I was part of uh, some of the chronological events here. Um, there was a lot of discussion and then ultimately a Utica OD article about the parking garage uh, dispute that's going on over the MOA and the shared costs, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that was mentioned was the fact that the council did not respond to uh, a letter and packet of sorts. Uh, so I just want to shed some light on that because we all were part of this and we did respond. We just did not respond publicly, which was appropriate at that time. We all received a packet to our home addresses a few months back from um, the county executive. Uh, that packet had uh, the original memorandum of agreement, and it also had a letter in it stating that the mayor uh, was supposed to respond to the county executive's um, uh, requests by a certain date. Does everyone remember this? Exactly. So we received this. Um, I called a couple of the council people. We talked about this. And ultimately, what the council did um, through our desk is request uh, if the mayor responded. Uh, it was urgent because at the time we received the letters uh, on the day of, it was past the date that the county executive was stating that the mayor had to have, re had to have uh, responded. So we did coordinate with um, the chief of staff and requested if, if there was a response. So not only did they state that there was a response, but they produced the response and actually told us how they responded and interacted with the county executive. From the perspective of the council, that's where we left it. Uh, that was a communication going on between two executives, the executive of the city, the executive of the county. And uh, from the perspective of the council, we uh, felt that that was appropriate at that time. Um, I did, I just want to let the council know, I didn't ask for a correction or anything like that, but I did call Steve Howe and uh, filled him in on the fact that we did receive those packets in that form to our home addresses. They were not even uh, sent to One Kennedy Plaza like all the other inner office mail that we have. So I just wanted to let the council know that I did address that with the media and that I did explain how we were presented that and how we interacted with the mayor so that uh, it was known. So I just wanted to state that um, I did follow up on that for all of us. So thank you. That's all I have this evening. Can I, be, just before we go. Okay, can I say something on that too? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, actually, um, if Councilperson Friend has something else, uh, that was my remonstrances. And just like all the others, that's my, those are my statements and we're moving on. Do you I have, have anything else? else? Okay. Would there be else? a legal mechanism in relation to open meeting laws by which the council could together tour Oneida Square late at night? There's, there's no reason. Uh, so here's how open meetings law is written. I mean, we all know. We've all read it. Right. Um, the council can come together and do a tour as long as they absolutely do not um, participate in discussing legislation, city business, or anything that would be sanctioned during a meeting. Okay. Uh, it's no different than if we all went to a Blue Sox game. Okay. Right? I would like yeah. to suggest yeah. that we might think about t okay. together going down to Oneida Square at night, which I never rarely do i might 
drive through with uh, with the chief, perhaps with Pastor Ballman, et cetera. And typically when we've done that in the past, uh, we would call a committee meeting for that mm. so that it's okay. still officially sanctioned amongst the council. Right. And Just then an we are covered. Yep. Okay. 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 Thank you. So you can go at night. There's things happening there at night. Not that it's not wonderful, but if you're talking about the homelessness specifically, the shelter's open. They get out at about 7 o'clock, and then combined with the corner store, I don't want to put this all on corner store, because it's not all corner store, at 7 o'clock. The rest of this week, so Thursday and Friday, groups of service providers meet um, at Cornerstone Church at 9 p.m. and walk the square, see who's out there, you know. So that might be a good opportunity for council welcome? people that, of course, okay. for council people that are involved to walk the square with the service providers. I don't know how many are coming because it's like the last two days of it. So most of them are Supervisors are, are working during the daytime, though. They yeah. might be a good opportunity they're, rather than night. They're working through the day. You can meet some of the service providers. And if I can say, I would not, I would not be in favor of nine of city officials going to Toronto Square to say, hey, look at the problem. Hey, as if, so, if you're not going to help, or understand individually, I wouldn't be in favor of this. It it's, all this is up to the council. That's why I said if you would like to do that, that's fine. I just yeah. was specifying the question on open meetings law. Is there a motion to adjourn at this time? Mr. President, Thank you. one thing I forgot to say before if there's anybody interested tomorrow, um, there is a public hearing regarding Brightwater Farms and Madman here in the chambers at 4 30. So if any residents or anybody has any questions, that's going on. Thank you. Second? Second. Okay, we're done. All right. Thank you.